You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just because I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. <laughs> Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh as if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. <laughs> Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. <laughs> Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so, wow, <laughs> there I go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, we're just going to take a minute to let everyone back into the room. I think we've got everyone. And I may have one person in the waiting room. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Um, so before we begin, um, we talked about uh, our mutual desire to share a moment of silence with all of you watching at home. So please join us um, as we share a far too brief moment for everyone whose voices and hearts have been silenced forever at the hands of hatred, ignorance, fear, and racism. We say their names. Eric Garner. Alton Sterling. Philando Castile. Dominique Clayton. Walter Scott. Sandra Bland. Bland. John Crawford III. Tamir Rice. Trayvon Martin. Ahmad Arbery and Brianna Taylor. And lastly, George Floyd. Please join us. Thank you, everyone. Um, it feels almost wrong to move on from <laughs> something like that. But uh, as we as a people have done for more than 400 years, we will push on and do what's right. And this talk is right. It is necessary. And hopefully it will inspire change and growth amongst everyone. Um, so it brings me overwhelming joy to offer my short loving introductions of each artist here. All of you have a special place in my heart. So let me begin with a fabulous young woman, a stunning artist, and someone I am honored to call my friend and colleague, Rihanna Thelwell. 
uh, a master of all musical genres and a leader within the African-American musical community, along with being the co-founder and artistic director of Opera Noir in Buffalo or in New York, Buffalo is my hometown in New York. <laughs> uh, we have baritone Kenneth Overton, my dear friend. Uh, I, I take special pride in this young performer. I have watched him transform into and immensely successful for such a young age. It is almost impossible to do what he's done at his age and a uh, determined man that he is today, uh, tenor Aaron Crouch. Then, oh, there we go. <laughs> Some of us call him dad because he takes care of all of us. Uh, but this man is a riveting performer, a fountain of joy and a, another wonderful colleague, Baritone Joshua Conyers. Uh, this young man is sparking change with his written word and his bravery in placing a stamp on history at this time uh, and constantly transforming strength with his beautiful, beautiful, unique voice, uh, Canadian baritone Andrew Adridge. Then a leader, a creator, a nurturer, and the, the hope for us all in raising the youth that will inherit a world that is hopefully better than it was tomorrow, Tyler Mason Draffin. <laughs> this one, board game extraordinaire, a singer of shanties, uh, and beyond a compelling performer, a compelling soul, and an advocate for all. He will stand up for you through thick and thin, tenor Joshua Blue. Uh, this guest, uh, we are we are classmates, but we didn't have a great chance to connect during our school years. But I feel extremely connected to him be, by his infectious new album, uh, and it's brought me a lot of joy and comfort during these difficult times. Uh, I am so happy to introduce trombonist, vocalist, composer, arranger, and band leader Jeffrey Miller. <laughs> and. Uh, Unfortunately, so you may notice that we have 11 strong here today. Uh, Freddie has been hit by Mother Nature. He's unable to join us, but he sends all of his love to us and to the entire audience. Um, but I had written, some might say he is the Dalila to watch, but his tenor <laughs> and captivating essence beyond his voice and talent will be legendary. Freddie Ballantyne, um, this next woman, I, there are not enough words, but she is a beacon of light, a muse to all, and a truth seeker, no matter the obstacles. And uh, I'm probably the 10th person to say this, but it feels almost wrong to call her just a soprano or just a singer, because around the world, I have watched her be anything and everything she wants to be, anything and everything someone needs her to be to serve their souls and her soul. So Julia Bullock. And finally, I love you all. I love all of you, but this is my greatest joy. Uh, <laughs> my, first, my first artistic inspiration and to me through the lens of a five-year-old child and, and now as a 28-year-old woman, the greatest painter to ever live. She is a teacher, an activist, and a community leader is my sister, Julia Bottoms. So, uh, Cool. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I am so grateful to share this space with you and take a step into the light uh, and into the circle of truth that I hope can come of all of this. Um, and I think it's a shared feeling that we've heard from a lot of great established artists who have gone through horrific things in their careers and their vulnerability has been so inspiring to us. Uh, and, and finally, everyone is seeing a peek behind the sacrifices they had to make so that the door would be open just a sliver for us. Um, but as, as the youth of this industry, of this art form, more so than an industry, it is our job to open that door fully, kick it down so it can never be closed again. So I, I think that this talk is gonna be a start for a lot of us to do that um, to the audience and to anyone here. I, just so you know, we are exhausted. Um, mm. What is happening in the world is exhausting. Uh, and, and it didn't start with the murders of these men this year. It started when we were born. It's been exhausting and the most wonderful thing to be black, but we're tired. 
So please be, uh, help us and be willing to accept what we say as loving and caring and a spark for change amongst all of us. Uh, that being said, it's kind of hard to know where to start. 2020 has had some of the lowest lows for me, <laughs> at least. Uh, but the potential to go higher than ever before between the names we have already spoken and the names that we will never know. Police brutality, COVID-19, protests around the globe, looting, militarization of local forces with inadequate training, drastic division on all parts of social, social media, violent responses to peaceful protest, peaceful protests turn violent, losing our jobs and what little sense of security we had in this world for the foreseeable future. Um, it's, it's been a complicated few months. Uh, and I guess the first question is, how does everything that's coming at us, the experience that is thrown at us full speed through the news, through text messages, through social media, sometimes unconsented relaying of information um, with people sending well-intended videos of young black men murdered on film and people being pepper sprayed and chased down um, by citizens doing what they think is right. Um, on top of everything that's going on in our personal struggles and within ourselves, <laughs> How do you feel right now uh, as an artist, as a human being who seeks good and as a black person? Josh, I have had some extensive talks with you, Josh Connors. Do you mind starting for us? Yeah, so I just wanna say, um, Amanda, thank you for you know, putting this all together. And we, I know that you know, thank you for giving us a space to talk about these things. And it's just wonderful to see so many beautiful black faces on the screen. And I'm glad that I get to do this with you all today. Um, how, how am I feeling? Oof. Um, to be honest, um, I have to say that I am numb. And the sad part about it is that this is not surprising at all. You know, for 400 years of oppression and, you know, you see, you know, in this country and the majority of the people in this country, the majority of this country can be, can choose to be willfully ignorant that this is something new. You know, I, you know, I, I weep for my people, for black people. And I, I also weep for this country because it's a country that, that refuses to recognize you know, the, the fundamental decency and, and humanity of black lives. I mean, watching George Floyd begging for something that is essential for all humans to survive when he gasped, I can't breathe because a knee is being pressed on his neck. The full weight of that white police officer's knee on his neck, the full weight of society that refuses to take the knee off of black people's necks, the full weight of the society that is permeated with white supremacist ideolo ideology. And it's penetrated just about every systematic agency, you know, especially our law enforcement. So I, I weep for us because George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, they, they're, they're human beings, black lives that should be alive today. And I feel like there's a serious uh, disregard for black lives. And it's not only in our police force, but I think it's at the core and the heart of, you know, American society. And um, that's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling numb, um, you know, and it's, you know, it's time for change. It's time for us to speak up. Yeah, that's how I'm feeling. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I know that we we had a, a deep conversation, you know, about um, the American dream, 
and as a black man, as a black woman, is that something that we can actually obtain? And before I answer that question, um, what sparked this question between me and Amanda was from somebody who's actually uh, quite dear to me, um, a white man who, who has taken care of me, who was a mentor of mine, who I love to this day. And he called me because uh, my wife and I had contracted coronavirus which was another scary thing within itself. And he was just checking up on us, asking us how we were doing, talking about the state of what happened with George Floyd and his concern for this country. And um, he said to me, but you know, I, I still have hope in this country because you know, when I see you and I see your story and what you've been through, um, you, you know, you are the epitome of what the American dream is. And in that moment, you know, I didn't say anything because I, 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 it hit me and I didn't know what to say. And um, I know he's watching and I love him. And, uh, but this is how I, when I broke it down and I had to think about it, this is, you know, what my thoughts were. And just bear with me as I give you a little background. Um, you know, I grew up, very, I grew up in New York City, mostly half in Virginia, very, you know, very, very poor town in the projects, Butler Housing in the Bronx, New York. Uh, lived mostly through the shelter system. So I dealt with homelessness, child abuse, spousal abuse. My parents are victims of, of the crack epidemic in the 80s and something they still struggle with today. And I had to find my way out. I was struggling in school. I was flunking out until I found music, where I started doing, started doing music, started doing classical music, 15 years old. I, it changed my life. I got an education, got two degrees, got three certificates, like just too many, right, to count, right? And, you know, I did all of that. I, I strapped up, you know, my, my bootstraps, and I lifted myself up out of that, that situation, of course, with tons of help and support from many, many people of many different colors. And I did all of that. And I'm still scared to walk down my street. I'm still scared to drive my car. Because I know that if I say something wrong, I move. Uh, a certain kind of way, I reach for something that I could die at any moment. Mm -hmm. So after doing all of that, after being an upstanding citizen, after getting my education, after making a good living, after li uh, now living in Watertown, Massachusetts in this beautiful apartment that I have, I am afraid of having the basic rights that we are supposed to have in America. And so that led me to believe, can I obtain the American dream? And I, I believe without a doubt, that is a lie that has been spewed to us to keep us in some kind of order, to keep us in some kind of way that we think that we can obtain to, and it's just not real. There's no way that I can do everything right and still be afraid to live, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I, that's it's something I had to think about, something I had to talk about uh, with me and my wife and to have that realization to be in the land of the free and the home of the brave and not have those fundamental rights. It's, it's a shock to the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And, um, it is now time for us to take that power back, to not live in this constant fear. Because, I mean, a lot of us live in this constant fear. And, you know, I, you know, I'm from the streets. So, like, I know what it's like. I've been there. I've seen it. And I'm still scared. You know, so it's time. I know for me, it's time for, to not be quiet any longer. And uh, my voice will be heard now and I'm gonna make sure that I do whatever is necessary for my voice and anybody who looks like me can have their voice be heard too. Absolutely. And, and going off what you said about 
power. We don't want everyone's power. We want our personal power. We want what belongs to us. We want that back because from the moment we came out of our beautiful mother's wombs, it was it was taken from us. So we don't want everything. We just want our peace. I, I think that is definite. Is there anyone, anyone who has something to share? And please don't feel pressured to share anything that is yours to keep. Yeah, I was gonna, um, I, can everybody hear me? Is it, is it yeah. working? Um, thank you for those beautiful words. Um, I was actually, before this, I was watching uh, Michael Che's Netflix special. Um, and uh, it's called Matters, Michael Che Matters. And I was literally, he was literally making the, I think at this point, viral joke that literally all we're saying is that Black Lives Matter. We're not saying they matter more than anybody else. We're just saying, like you said, we're just, we just want what's what we're like, what we're entitled to. Those are our rights as human beings to not live in fear for driving our car or walking down the street or wearing a hoodie or buying a, a bag of Skittles. You know what I mean? So, I think, I for me, it just I wake up. There's no telling how I'm gonna feel when I wake up every day. It's either I'm completely tired. I don't feel like doing anything out of you know out of this depressing situation, or I'm I'm completely fired up. I want to you know sort of bite back at everybody who's you know not getting it, not understanding. And then I can also find myself in a space of being patient and wanting to hear to really hear everybody out, even the even the people who are saying some pretty racist things. Some people who just who just are refusing to see the point. Um, so sometimes I actually find myself in a in a space of okay, let me actually hear where you're coming from, so I can figure out how to how to enlighten you on on you know the contradictions that may arise in your way of thinking, um, and really just hear where the other side is coming from. But there's no telling waking up how I'm going to really feel about dealing with all this, um, and I think I think that's okay. Um, but it's, you know, it's exhausting as we all have said. So it's, but I'm, I'm glad that we, I'm glad that this is actually, it feels different for some reason now. Um, and I have hope in, in what can come out of this, but it, we just got to keep going. We, just, we can't let up. Even when this coronavirus thing, you know, when everybody's reopened and, our ways of life has, have resumed. I feel like that's when we need to press harder, harder than ever, really. So that's all I have to say for now. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Julia. <laughs> Label this Dahlia, Julia. I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> Oops, I'm unmute here. Um, I think for me, I've been feeling a lot of frustration, a lot of disappointment, but I'm not surprised. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing for me is. Uh, I mean, growing up in a neighborhood that was mixed, but predominantly white, I think seeing the reactions of people that call themselves your neighbors and your friends and uh, you know, your classmates, to see some of the things that are being said, uh, it's pretty, again, not surprising, but amazing to me how quickly people forget that you, you know, you're a person just like them. Um, but one thing that I would say on this particular moment in time that I've been finding is I think the way that things are going is really a reflection of not only like the racial climate in our country, but just kind of like where we've come in terms of social interaction, um, especially with the way that people are reacting with protests. Uh, I feel like I'm seeing a very all or nothing sort of attitude where either people are out there protesting and doing you know something, but then I'm seeing a lot of people kind of take a back seat and feel as though just posting a blackout picture is enough or just, uh, I don't know, saying I support you is enough. And the thing that I keep trying to impress on people that I know is support verbally is not enough. If you aren't taking action, then really that support is hollow. Um, and in my eyes, I think it just, we each have a responsibility to do something, each and every one of us, white, black, whatever you are, you have a responsibility to the people around you. And the sooner it gets better for us, sooner it gets better for everybody. So really, I just think people need to, if they have a voice, if they have a talent, if they have a platform, they have to come out and show up. Doesn't mean that everybody has to march. You know, some people can, 
And it doesn't mean everybody has to educate. Some people can't. But if you, whatever you do, if you, you know, have a gift of baking, <laughs> bake great cookies and take care of the people that are out there, you know, pushing themselves to the limit. If you are good at, you know, being hospitable, take people in, bring them up, give them comfort. I think each of us has that responsibility. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Um, and does anyone else have to add to that before I kind of <laughs> go into my bit? Okay. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I told everyone if they need a moment just to please remove themselves and feel free. No worries. You're not, this isn't a show. You don't have to be on screen and put on any sort of a face the whole time. Take care of you. Um, I, I personally, I'm starting to realize how separate my work life was from my personal life and my work identity was from my personal identity and how much, I mean, I, and as, as a mixed person, it's a very different experience. There's the whole colorism within our own race and the privileges within our own race. That is a whole other discussion that we would have to take days and days to talk through. So I find myself acknowledging my privilege and I find myself, <laughs> I, I reflect on all the things I let pass by because I worried about my job so much. And now that I don't have a job, I'm like, what? If I don't care about my soul and my well being and my art isn't furthering that, do I want to be an artist? Do I want to call myself a part of an industry? And Andrew, I think you can speak on this a lot in, in one of our further topics. But I'm, when I sing, I'm singing folk tunes and I'm singing musical theater and I'm singing the songs from the radio that I connect to. And I love opera, but I, I'm I'm realizing that all of the complications that come with it to serve everyone that's up at the top, everyone who's getting the big bucks and everyone who's donating the big bucks, but don't care about us if we live or die at times. I'm so torn and I'm thankful for this time to reflect uh, and I'm fired up and I'm grateful to have people like you who are willing to let me say that on a public platform and not condemn me. Um, <laughs> yes. One quick note on that, what you were saying about service. I think uh, that's one more thing that I just wanted to jump off of is remembering like who we are serving, who do we, uh, you know, who, who do we owe something to? And I think to me, we owe something to our community, not just to our job. Uh, I would say that all of us have probably made it to where we are with support from our community. So I think we owe that back to them you know, and to put that fear aside for, you know, whether or not we might not get a gig down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, so, yeah, thank you for this note. Uh, just so we don't get any mic feedback, could everyone, when you're not speaking, just mute yourselves? Uh, I, I, it might be a little, I'm not tech savvy in that way. Um, so thank you for all of that already, for exposing yourselves in a way I, I feel that I've never, I've never felt so empowered to say my truth. I've never felt that I could speak for myself. I was always speaking for a company or for a character. I was always, I think this was said in your, uh, in your talk with Janae and with, uh, with Larry and Morris, Julia, uh, that we can't act on stage and in rehearsal and then it could be expected to carry that into our lives and be functioning human beings. Uh, it's just not possible. And we're realizing that we're taking stock of what's going to help us get through to tomorrow. Um, so uh, again, Larry Brownlee, Morris Robinson, um, Russell Thomas, just a few examples of people who have talked about being degraded, ignored, marginalized um, in their artistic setting. For me, it's reminded, it's reminded a lot of us, I think, that to the outside world, we are just another black person regardless of our excellence and how much work we put in how many degrees josh or josh or tyler or aaron how many degrees any of us have they, they don't care we we are just another person um so when and i i talked with i think josh Connors about this it's very interesting that i've never heard anyone else be labeled their heritage in an artist. I've never heard, oh, the, the Italian artist or the French artist for the most part. It's only the black artist. 
and maybe the Asian artists. I've never, I've, I can't really remember that ever happening, but why is it that we have to take on not just an entire country, an entire race? Um, so when did you realize you were a black artist? When did you, did you embrace it? Have you yet to embrace that identity? Has it shaped you in some way? Do you have any holdups about it? Uh, um, go ahead, Ann. Well, for, for me, because um, I grew up in like a predominantly white neighborhood as well, but my mom, my mom made sure that my brother and I went to a school that had a lot of diversity. So I hung out with kids of all different shades and like that that even spilled into when I went to summer camp. And keep in mind, I, I love this summer camp. I love the guy that I'm about to talk about. However, I, cause I met him when I was like nine and like worked with a guy through a bunch of cool stuff. We did outreach program, my brother worked with him. Like he made sure that my mom was able to like be there and like make sure that like we were okay. He truly did care, yet he wasn't really educated about how to talk to certain people. Because I remember when I was 10, this man looked me dead in my face and said, sing it more blackish. And I knew what he meant. I knew he wanted more runs. I knew he wanted riffs, emotion. He wanted all that. However, I did not recognize at that age that that it, 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 borderlined, on this, it, it borderlined on the racist. And he's not like that. And it wasn't until I got older, and as I heard him say that to me more and more, because it became like a loving sort of like term between the two of us. And it wasn't until I was older that I was in college that it like, I remembered it one day and I was like, huh. In, in front of an entire room for years, I let him say this to me. And like, even my brother was in the audience and he didn't know any better. I mean, we were children. And it wasn't until I got, I think, really to college that I started noticing that I think the world started seeing me as a black artist as well. Cause like all of a sudden I wasn't getting stuff like Johnny Skeeky Zeta. I wasn't doing, um, I wasn't doing Florence Pike and Albert Herring anymore. All of a sudden I was doing a bunch of corgis. All of a sudden I was doing, you know, fire set up in my bones. All of these works are great. But at the end of the day, my artistry does not end with my skin tone. I am capable of a bunch of different things. I'm capable of a bunch of different genres and I can sing down and every single person on this planet can go down on their genre, whatever they choose. That does not mean that because we are black, that is all we are capable of doing. And luckily I'm now paired with somebody who has gotten me jobs outside of, you know, just being black. But I mean, as, as, um, as happy as I was to get my offer from WNO, I kind of felt like I was filling a quota for them because the first season that I was there, I, I mean, I was scheduled to do blue and scheduled to do Porgy due to the, due to the pandemic that never happened. But the only other thing that I was doing was flute, which is like, cool, it's standard rep. Then the next year, the only thing that I really had scheduled was Nixon in China. And like, I get it, it's a young artist program. Like you're not necessarily, you're not, um, I'm losing words, but you're not guaranteed a certain role. But however, whenever the black opportunities came around, I was available all of a sudden. And don't get me wrong. I enjoy working for the company that I'm, well, was working for. Um, however, just noticing those like little like tidbits of something's highly suspicious here. Like all of a sudden there's a pattern. Like pick up on things like that mention it to people. Cause I mentioned it to the person that I was talking to that all of a sudden got me jobs from here, 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 and here doing more than just what my skin tone says that I can do. Cause trust me, if you listen to me, I'm capable of a lot. We all are. That's my piece on it. Yes. Yes. And it's, uh, we work in the same place. We work side by side, second lady, third lady right here. And you, <coughs> Like our program is very diverse. The ratio, we, we almost represent half of the program. So it's almost like, well, they're doing it right, right? But, and, and honestly, our, our team, they are advocates for us. And I feel that they don't train us any differently because of our race. But the overarching company that it comes with, they have things they need to fulfill. And going off of Porgy, this is not a WNO story, but I have heard some things about um 
oh, well, do that thing, do that thing you guys do. Uh, or, or I didn't, or chorus master saying to a group, uh, and uh, this is all hearsay, but you know what? I believe it. Uh, I didn't know what to expect from you guys. Like yeah. you came in expecting us to fail. And that's because I was, I actually, I worked with Julia on fire and I mean, I was a part of the course. So I was doing like diction coachings and one of our coaches in the, the black congregation scene was like, can we say Jesus? And we're like, what? And like, exactly, like the, the look that every, everyone gave in the room, because it was an all black cast, we said in ne no congregation would say it that way. And she's like, but it'll sound better. I'm like, do you want to do it correctly? Or do you want to do it your way? Because I don't care to do it your way. We ended up singing Jesus, because, uh, you know, you can't stop us. So, mm. and it, but it was wild to see somebody just take something that an entire room of people was like, but that's wrong. And they didn't care. And it was just like, why are you doing the show then? If you don't want to hear our viewpoints, our history, our stories, why are you bothering with it then? You know? And that was just the one person that doesn't speak for the whole company. And it probably doesn't speak for them either. But the fact that they were so combative as to this is the correct way to do it, was already off-putting. And it was just like, why Why are we doing this? Because at, at this point, it didn't feel like our story anymore. It felt like theirs. Well, I, I think also on top of that, there we spend a lot of time and energy um, researching every single thing that we do. I think each and every one of us is terrified of coming into a space, being ignorant of something. And so to then walk into a work environment where we know we are hired for a very specific purpose and proud to fulfill that role, but there's not the same amount of care and research done. That's where I just lose my, yeah, I've just, I'm again, I'm just sort of through, I'm through being gentle in my communication with artistic staff about that because I can, you know, you can find a way gently to mention, I mean, you know, a lot of us, we are gotten really well versed in code switching and um, maneuvering our way through different white, just whiteness, moving our, maneuvering our way through whiteness. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I cannot understand. I think I'm, I'm just, I'm with you, Rihanna. I just, it's very hard to understand the lack of uh, consideration that is going, that goes into projects. It's like just having black faces on stage does not mean that you are making any sort of a cultural statement. And it does not mean that you have, are actually serving, as you said, other Julia, you are actually serving and representing something truthfully. And yet we are told constantly, always tell the truth, make sure this is authentic. Um, and part of that is because there are, it's very rare to see uh, artist, or, or administration, artistic administration creatively on the other side of the table. And we are asked, talk about being like the, like designated black artist. There's usually a person within a cast who's designated to be the, per, to be the individual to speak on behalf of the rest of the cast in order for everyone to feel safe. That is a crazy pressure that we put on each other and on ourselves. And yet we all are feeling the same kind of weight and hurt and tension. Tyler, go ahead, honey. And then Andrew. Uh, yeah, I, I am, I'll have only been in a couple of operas, so it's, um to speak on that, it's a little different for me, but I can definitely say that even though, uh, you know, there are some people who are very knowledgeable that they have to be, as some people were saying, truthful and have to admit that, you know, they don't have all the answers. So it's, it's up to them to reach out to 
people who look like us if they if they have any questions or if they want to know very specific things uh, to help a performance uh, in a better way. And uh, just to go off of, of Rihanna's comment of, you know, uh, white supremacy and uh, covert white supremacy, I feel I uh, noticed a pyramidal chart uh, in the past couple of weeks, and it just it talked about things that, you know, can be said in an everyday way that are just very white supremacist, like color blindness, and um, you know, oh, you you talk very proper for a black person, and it's just very, uh, it's very easy to get away with those things. But now I think shedding light on like these things that can happen every day are um things that you know shouldn't be said so that's pretty much what i have to say about that amazing and i love that tyler and big sis julia and jeffrey that you are here please speak on your experiences if you feel safe please speak on your craft because we are in our bubble and aware of our struggles and it would be interesting to hear how i mean your education, how you educate young kids affects how we can do outreach or how they grow up to be opera singers. Julia, the art you do, it affects what we see in the visual aspects when we refer to a craft beyond. And jazz is a legitimate art form. It's not just for black people. It needs to be studied and respected in conservatories and universities In whatever school is teaching music, you need to teach jazz. I don't care, period. So please feel free to speak on your experiences and don't feel that you have to look at the lens of opera. I want to learn in this as I, I believe everyone does. Um, and before we go on to those little, those little comments that get to us, I want to hear from Andrew about this because I, I commend you. how brave you have been in your post, all of you. Thank you. And thanks for allowing me to bring a little Canadian perspective to this kind of conversation. I used to think that I was benefited from not being witness to the blatant kind of truth of the racism that I see in America. But I realize now that it is just as bad that it is a suppressed covert kind of undercurrent as it is in Canada. And that kind of relates to how my story is. Um, the day that I realized I was a black artist that actually happened when I was an undergrad. I was in my third year and I was in a master class. It was a music theater master class with a white clinician who was very established in kind of classic music theater. And um, I was to sing second and my friend was to sing first, a white man, he's a bass, a very beautiful singer. I'm not gonna use his name, um, but he sang Old Man River. And I thought, and it was beautiful the way that he sang it. I, I thought that the way that he conveyed it well, I mean, I know there's, there's probably issue with you know the the kind of a white person singing this this piece, but uh, but I think that he brought a certain aspect to it that I that I heard for the first time. I, I heard a beauty in his voice that I had never heard before. Something that I again maybe now thinking about it was was not was a, a thinking that was based in kind of a systemic kind of sub current undercurrent that happens in Canada rather than actually knowing the issues and kind of the magnitude of what was happening. But but um, at that time I thought it was very beautiful. And um, the first thing that the white clinician said after he sang, I thought it would be a great job or something along those lines. The first thing that he, she said was, how do we feel about the person singing, use of the words them and dare in the piece? And like, as, it, as to say that this is, and she did say, this is um, like language that we would only expect from a black singer. And I kind of was taken aback. I did not expect that to be a topic of conversation at all. I didn't know what to say. I, and I, I didn't think that it was gonna be something that would prevail in the conversation. I thought it would kind of die down very quickly and we'd move on to you know the typical, and this is what you could do better and whatnot. But I, it was met with kind of a flurry of white people standing up and voicing their outrage or voicing their opinion on how this should be sung and, and that a black person should do this and a white person should do that. And the moment I realized my blackness in this moment was when a white lady from behind me stood up and pointed at me and said, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but aren't you outraged at what you're seeing here? And me as an 18 year old something just beginning 
uh, my kind of journey as a singer, I had my moment, and I think we probably all have had our moment of looking around a room and realizing that, oh, it's me. I looked around and first looking for a teacher or someone to come to my aid, not really looking for what I thought of, what I realized I was looking for, but, I, but in that looking around, I realized that it was me, that I was the black person in the room. There was nobody else who was gonna come to my rescue here to kind of help me out of a situation that as a young student, I don't feel like I should be having to navigate right now, especially having to sing next in this masterclass. And um, I gave a very kind of mediocre response because everything that you're supposed to be as a black person, as you were saying, Julia, in a white society came to the forefront for me. It was that you can't speak out of turn that much, is that you can't, you have to brush things off to save face, is that you have to, the speaking could risk you being the troublemaker and not really having an opinion as I feel like white people are more allowed to have, but to be, but turning into an aggressor, even though that's you just trying to point out the very trigger that is happening to you in this space. And I, and I gave this kind of response that I felt very mediocre about in the end. I said, oh, I think that he did a great job. And he came to me after the masterclass and apologized for singing. And I, and I said, I don't know if it's my place to feel sorry about it. But every but after that day, everything that had happened to me as a singer, as an artist, and everything that would happen to me afterward has been of influence of my blackness first and my worth as an artist second. And I think that that is something that we can all kind of share probably as a sentiment, thinking that I'm walking into a, I've heard it, I've heard it echoed already of walking into a room, feeling my blackness before I feel my artistry. Walking in, regardless of what your piece you're doing, if it's Porgy or if it's Cozy Fantute, walking into a room and feeling, am I here because I'm black? Am I looked at because I'm black? Is everything that I am because I am black today? Or is it because I'm an artist? Is it because I have a voice? Is it because I legitimately have something to say? And I've, I've never been able to kind of navigate away from that. And I think it has a lot to do, as I said earlier, with the fact that Canada's race problem isn't America's. It isn't something that people talk about. It isn't something that people are ready to acknowledge. We have just the same racist past as America does, but it lays in the shadows because everyone wants to be Canada the good. Nobody wants to acknowledge us for what we are, for, for the fact that we have huge problems with our indigenous communities, huge problems with our black communities, but we don't acknowledge those. And the fact that we don't have those conversations has led to me, led me to a place where I don't even feel like I belong in an industry. I feel like the work that you, that as Americans you can do is light years ahead of where, what, what we can do right now. You can start to have the conversations around how do we get black advisors in the arts councils? How do we get black, how do we get black people on these boards of directors? How do we get black people as music directors, as stage managers, as, as makeup artists, as stage crew? That is not even here because we have a tokenization idea of what black means on stage. Our quota that is filled on stages in Canada, I believe is I can put a black artist as a Carmen or I can put a black artist as, um, as a Tosca. And that's, a, and that's enough. And, and it is, is enough and it suffices because nobody has a conversation. So that's my long-winded, sorry, response to the, to the first part about when I realized my identity as a Black artist. But it's something that as a Canadian, we can't even speak out on because we don't even know how that identity is formed yet. We don't even know what a sense of belonging truly even looks like. And hopefully we can start having those discussions in Canada that need to happen about the fact that our idea of Blackness on stage or representation on stage is performative and not authentic. And that we can get to a place, and I believe that a place that we all want to see where Black is as neutral as white. Exactly. That's, that's amazing. Uh, who just, I don't want to cut off anyone. That was me. Uh, I mean, I was just co-signing what he said. I mean, yeah. I, uh, that's funny. I, I'm thinking about that was really that was really enlightening for me personally because I remember my my second year of undergrad at, at Juilliard, uh, one of the new um, freshmen, ironically in the in the in the vocal arts program, he was from Canada or is st still from Canada, but at the time he was from Canada and he, you know, we were talking about you know the the race situation in America and he told me 
that he was like in Canada. I mean, he wasn't, he was colored, but he wasn't, he wasn't black. He was, I think he was Filipino and another, uh, he was Filipino and mixed with something else. Uh, I don't recall exactly, but he was talking about how in Canada, he told me that they don't really see, like they don't divide it by color like that. Like they don't have black Canadian, white Canadian. And I was like, I was like, no, I, I guess y'all don't. So I, and he told me, he was like, I guess I believed him and him saying that there wasn't really a, a, a color issue or a race issue in Canada, just by, you know, that simple example. But then your, Andrew, your, your, your points that you made definitely enlightened me and woke me up because I always, to, since then, I always figured, okay, I guess Canada doesn't have to really worry about the race problem because they all see each other as Canadians, right? But I didn't, thank you for enlightening me on that because I really was ignorant in that. And um, We're all if I, I may, yeah, for sure, bro. And if I may um, just speak on my uh, experiences as a, as a jazz major at Juilliard, um, my first year, um, and I, I've actually been reflecting on this for a minute because I, I just got my master's in May. And so I, I really, after that, the next day I just sat and really meditated on my whole experience, um, my whole six years there. And it, it was a lot, it was, it was a very intense sort of meditation experience. It's actually not even done, but I, what I gathered is that for one, my very first year there, the artist diploma program was literally all white jazz musicians um and it's it just it just really shocked me because i mean i later noticed that the the artist diploma was mainly used to help international students get visas and you know get their education up from juilliard and everything like that but it still bothered me because there was this artist diploma was also the the poster group for the Juilliard Jazz Program, right? So they're the ones who went off campus and performed at private events and did jazz festivals representing Juilliard Jazz. And I guess the reason I had a problem with that is because if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have a, a representative group, it needs to be, it needs to reflect not only the where the art came from. I mean, it's a black art form, period, point blank. There's no, there's no question mark behind that, no asterisk. Um, and also, you have Black students in your program, and they need to be represented. That's just that I don't understand why that isn't a priority um, or it wasn't a priority. It's gotten, it's, it's kind of gotten better. It hasn't really, I can't really say that there have been any Black students in the, in the program to this day, but they're definitely diversifying it to some extent. Um, and mind you, this was my very first year at Julia. My freshman year was the year that Winter Marsalis took over as artistic director. So he definitely, to my knowledge, had some had some plans on, you know, switching it up from the previous uh, administration, which is which I'm which I'm thankful for. And over the years, I've definitely noticed um, the program become more colorful, which I'm thankful for. It allowed me to be more comfortable. There were still things that. I was definitely uncomfortable with um, in the school, regardless of that. Um, but it's a step. I'm going to acknowledge that that is a step. Um, but it's just, I noticed myself, um, just people would call me uh, sort of like the poster boy for Julia Jazz, right? Just because they put me in everything. They put me on all the brochures, gave me, you know, a lot of opportunities to be in front of donors. Like, literally, I would get probably an email a week asking if I could do this donor event or, you know, be involved in some kind of, you know, some kind of thing. And I was like, okay, cool. But there's just, if I, how can I say this? There's, I feel like I was, there's a part of me that was like, okay, cool. I get to represent for my community. But there was also an issue with you know, as the program was getting more colorful, I'm like, you can't, you can't call my man right here who literally is playing so much trumpet next to me, who is a black man in this program. You can't call, like, 
I'm not the only, you know, it just, you know, it just reflecting on, on all the, all the issues that I didn't really notice um, were there um, was just something that I'm, I'm currently dealing with. So yeah, I just wanted to speak on that. No, amazing. Amazing. And, and something you touched on a little bit is it's not just to recruit us. It's not enough to just recruit us because finance is a huge barrier for a lot of students. There are so many students who go to these big conservatories and they're like, I am doing it. And they make their whole community proud, but then they struggle. They are set up for a system of struggling. That is, it is, everyone has to take out loans, but it is disproportionately on students of color to somehow pull their bootstraps up and find a job in an industry that is against them and has prejudice and pay off all those loans and still have some sense of self-worth. So, and, and the whole poster boy or um, poster boy tokenism thing is a whole nother issue we can go into. Um, we have Julia Bottoms, big girl Bottoms. Oh, am I, okay. Uh, yeah, I think Andrew brought up some really good points, especially like, and I think with Buffalo, we're so close to Canada. So we do kind of experience um, some of that issue with the racism that's under the surface uh, to a great degree, I would say. Um, one of my main issues with it is that you could have people that invite you over for dinner and then, you know, only to find out that they feel a type of way about people of color, you know, in, in other conversations. But also people that might protest and march alongside of you, but then you find out that they have these biases and these, uh, I mean, everybody has bias to a degree, but some really, really difficult, concerning viewpoints on where Black people will fit into their, you know, worldview. Um, but the other thing I was going to bring up is the idea of uh, what you're saying about having diversity just for the sake of diversity in my eyes. Um, it's, to me, I think we have to start telling people if you are going to call us for a diversity moment to like have us be the poster child for whatever you need funding, um, to have us speak out on inclusion and all those sort of things, stop calling us if you're not going to really value what we say when, you know, the cameras stop rolling. I, I don't want to always be the person that's like standing there for the funding. And then, you know, when I, when I point out things that are troubling, not have that considered. Um, so for me, I, I think what I'm trying to say is it's definitely, unfortunately, going to be a sacrifice on our part. But I think it's something that we have to do collectively. And it's going to mean, you know, difficulty. But it'll continue if we don't put our foot down and say enough is enough. Either value us as a person, value our artistry, value our opinions, or don't call us for diversity. Josh? Conyers? And then Josh Blue. Yeah, um, I just want to touch on um, something that uh, Andrew had said. Um, just about our power structures in all, you know, all facets of our businesses. And so you see companies who will have a season with tons of black artists and different kinds of artists of color. And um, I'm thinking now, as I look, you, you see all the sports stuff and you see how NBA is 70 something percent black. You see the NFL is 60 something percent black, but all the owners are white. And the NBA, besides Michael Jordan, all of um, the owners in the NFL are white, except for a guy who I believe is of some kind of Asian descent. So, I mean, um, they they use our bodies, you know, and you know, and our you know, and our talents to you know put out this product, you know, and we do that, and we're happy to do that because this is you know this this is what we do, this is what we're happy to do. But when it comes to the power structure of actually, like of us, like actually having faith, we're not just there, but black, um, that when we look around and we see the people who are on the other side of the table and none of them look like you, how are we supposed to trust that you're actually doing this for the right reasons instead of checking off that box? You know, so how can I trust when you say that you support black artists when everybody who's around you and everybody who you hire to be in a position of power doesn't look anything like me. And that's a discussion that we need to have with people in power. And I'm talking about that's every, I think that's just about every company I've ever been at. Every young artist program, I've done just about all of them. 
and you know all the summer programs and the young artists I have I just don't see people of color in those positions who can actually have a say in um, you know these processes of when black people or people of color are doing different roles. The first time I saw a, a group of black people was um, doing a Porgy and Bess. That was the first time I saw more than two people who look like me at a company. That was the first time ever. And it still continues that way. Every time I, I'm in a theater and we're not doing Porgy and Bess or Blue or something like that, I don't see uh, you know, people of color. Like most of, most of the time it's me or another person. And um, I think that comes from somebody not being in that room when they cast us, when they decide what stuff that, you know, that we're gonna do. Um, there's just nobody there to advocate for us. And if they really advocated for us, they would have people who look like us in those rooms, having those conversations, seeking out donors who look like us and who are willing to support us. And I mean, and I mean, that's, I mean, that's for me, in my opinion, that's what it comes down to. Now, I kind of wanted to address of when I thought, uh, when I figured out I was the, a Black artist, if that's okay. Um, first year of undergraduate, uh, my, my graduate uh, at IU, and uh, I'm doing uh, Valentine and Faust. Uh, pretty good, you know, Ari's all that stuff, was super excited to do it and working with somebody who was, um, who, who was white, but international. Um, not from America, and um, who was now really starting to make their name. And now this person is runs an opera company in America, very well known. And for all intentions, I, I, I believe that he, when he said this to me, that he, he thought he meant it in a, in a good light. But this is what he said to me, and it's always stuck with me. And it's, oh, it's been a big problem for me ever since this moment. He, I finished doing uh, my aria at the beginning, and then we were just doing all of my scenes. I did the aria, did the, the shame, did the deaf scene, uh, feeling really good. Uh, had some teachers in there who were all saying, oh, you were just wonderful, it was beautiful. He, uh, we took our 15, he pulls me outside and says, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, sure. And he says to me, you know, I think um, you have one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard as a, as a young singer. And, um, you know, I know you, I know you know the realities of being um, a black singer, you know, in America, but um, since you already have that, like that fighting for you, you can't be black and big and be successful in the business. It's like, you know, you really have to work on your, like your body because I believe that vocally you have what it takes to, you know, do this and be very successful and be like, you know, an amazing artist out there. But like, if you don't lose weight, you're gonna have lots and lots of struggles. And ever, ever since that day, you know, cause I finally, then I went back and I asked um, some of my teachers who from undergrad who I really trust, you know, is this a reality? And they was like, yeah, it's a reality. And everywhere I've been since that day, my weight has come up. I'm talking about everywhere, from every single person in power, look at my, resu look at my resume, everywhere I've been. My, the discussion of my weight has been a, a topic of discussion. So um, they hire me and then they tell me that, you know, I have to lose weight. So it's, it's interesting um, that it always stuck with me about being black and being big and can they, can they coexist on the stage of, I guess, this this white art that we have, and um, that's just a I mean, what I'm hearing is just this constant objectification of you. Yeah. In, yeah. So I'm, I'm feeling you there. Uh, is it okay if I pass the torch to Josh Blue? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, perfect segue. I mean, look, Josh Conyers. Me and you are big black men. And just last year, we were on stage doing Traviata together. And that was an incredible experience for me to be able to be on stage and turn my head and see another person who looked like me in so many more ways than one and get to have a moment of saying, you know, here we are. 
we're on the main stage, we're performing together. This is not, you know, a chorus bit. They gave us the opportunity to kind of show our voices to, to the world. And, you know, I always have looked up to you um, as a bigger brother to me uh, since, I, since I met you. And it's wild that we've only really known each other for two years. Uh, I love you too, Conyers. But it's like, you know, the, the idea of this, the, the phrase, the black artist, I, I love it and I hate it all the time. You know, I love it because I'm proud of being a black man and I'm proud of being a black artist and I'm proud of being able to use my voice to amplify, you know, people and uplift people that look like me and show them that, you know, black people like we're here where we're in we're in every facet of your arts organizations. You're just too blind to open your eyes and see that we're right there. Like we're, we're ready. We're prepared. We exist. We're not going anywhere, you know? And I love, I love the connotations that come with that, but I hate the, the tokenism that comes with the term, you know, I, and it is like what you're saying, like we don't have, no one refers to a white artist as a white artist. Um, they're just an artist. They were the primary artist, and everyone else is this like subcategory underneath artist. Um, and so many companies are well-meaning. I genuinely want to believe that they're well-meaning when they hire, you know, black artists and artists of other artists of color. But then when they only want to use us for a concert of spirituals, it's like, well, here we go. We're gonna wheel out our black artists so they can do their black art, and then we're gonna put them back and we'll take them out later. Um, and it's really disheartening to be a thing that, you know, happens time after time after time. Um, and oftentimes in these moments, we don't even get to pick what we're, what we're going to do. You know, we're told by, as Kanye said, an administration that is usually more white than not or entirely white. And they say, here are the black songs that we want you to sing to represent black people everywhere. And... You have to sit there and say, well, I, I need a paycheck. So sure. Like, here we go. Like, let's do our, let's do this concert and then never get to say anything. We don't get to speak. We don't get to, you know, say our mind. We don't get to make program notes. We don't get to talk about how these pieces affect us or how they don't affect us. You know, we're just expected to go out and do them. And it's exhausting. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a, it's such a chore to have to do time after time after time. But I don't. You know, I, I wish that we were at a point in our lives where we were considered just artists. Um, and we didn't have to have the term in front of it to denote that we're a different type of artist. And if you want to, if you want to recognize yourself as a black artist and self-identify as a black artist, then you absolutely should do it because that's what's important to you. You know, that's your, your identity is important to you. Um, but I just hate that other people are imposing our identity on us every time they refer to us as a black artist. Yeah, amazing. And the, the gratitude that is expected in turn for it, we are supposed to be so thankful for that, that concert, a concert that doesn't speak necessarily to what we believe in. So we can't, I, up until now, I could never imagine us doing a Black Lives Matters concert and saying that out loud in a concert for any company. I would not believe it. Maybe now that would be amazing if we could say I'm singing this song on behalf of this because I believe it, that things haven't changed or things are getting better and, and the programming. And I hear a lot of people saying, we need to see the people in power, um, we need to see that lineup change, but more so in the rehearsal room. Like I'm tired personally of being told how to be a black person by someone who is not black. That's very frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating to, to be told how to be the best black person I can be. And we're kind of gonna segue now into, into those things that people say, people who don't understand our experience and our struggle, the, the ones that are not universal, the experiences that you have to be us. You have to go through our lives to understand it. Uh, we've, we've kind of titled this section, but they meant well. When I, when I think of any time I faced adversity or oppression by someone, at least in the workplace, I expected I would be protected in some way. And every time I recall 
there being an excuse. I don't recall an apology. I, I recall an excuse for that person's actions that basically boils down to ignorance. Um, and, and I kind of didn't want to at first include this part because our industry is so ruled by the dollar. And a lot of times the people that are saying these things are are the ones that are funding it. Um, but I wanted to know, I think we're all eager to know how events like this have affected our, our ability to do our job, how it's affected each of us outside of the rehearsal room. When we leave to go home, we think about this stuff. It doesn't just stay at the studio. Um, and has there been any response from your companies or your leaders? Have they done anything to try and make a safer community for you? Because your mental health is, is essential to safety. Your self-worth is essential. So um, anyone, uh, Josh, I was going to toss this to you. And yeah, if, if you don't mind speaking again. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think, you know, it doesn't matter how old anyone in this chat, how old a black artist specifically is. We all can remember some of the first times that someone said something to us that was well-meaning that we might not have had the language to understand why it was not as well-meaning as it was. We've all had those comments. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to share. I remember the earliest memory uh, of one of these things happening shaped my self-perception for 15 years without me, w without me realizing it until, you know, it was a few years ago that I realized why I, I had to do these things. Uh, I grew up playing piano. Uh, that was my first instrument. I always thought I was going to be a pianist. Um, and I would do, you know, recitals and piano competitions as a kid. You know, I'm talking like elementary school, middle school. Um, and when I was, I think in late elementary school, I played a recital uh, that was of my piano teacher's students. Uh, and we had a little reception afterwards. And an older white woman came up to me uh, by myself, like I wasn't with my mom, I was just standing like with a glass of punch or something. And she leaned in and said to me, I never would have imagined that a boy with hair like yours could play piano as well as you did. And, you know, as a kid, you know, I'm what? I'm, I'm nine, 10, 11, 12. Like I, I don't have the understanding of what that comment really was. So I said, thanks. And I've kind of looked back on how that shaped my own self image moving forward. But I think about myself as a kid, I always cut my hair short after that. You know, I cut my hair short. Uh, I got to high school and I chemically relaxed my hair so it would be straight. Uh, and I had to stop doing that one day because I burned my face on it, you know? And it was it was uh, these constant things of feeling like as soon as my hair gets to a certain length, I have to cut it or else no one's going to take me seriously. Um, and it wasn't really until I got into kind of later college, grad school even, that I realized how much that had hurt me growing up. Um, and now I grow my hair out, you know? I've, I haven't cut my hair in a year. And it's not just because... I love my hair because I do. I love my hair. But because I want to be able to go on stage and have a kid who was like a little 11 year old Josh see me now with my afro and my hair picked out and see me sing classically on a stage and go, that guy's got hair just like me and he loves it and he's proud of it and he's doing good work and he's singing and he's making his dreams come true. You know, it's really important for me to be able to show people that with hair like this, you can still achieve everything you want to achieve. It's not hindering what you can do. Um, and it's just like, and, I'm, and I think of that lady all the time. And I know that she did not, I know that she didn't mean it to come off as horribly as it came off, but she just didn't have the understanding to, to think of what she was saying before she said it and realize that it was horrible. It was a horrible thing to say to a child, you know? And there's a lot of these well-meaning comments that we hear today. You know, everyone on this chat is an established artist in their field. We are working our asses off constantly and we'll still get people that come up to us and say, you speak so well. Y Thank you. 
You know, it's just what what are you trying to get across from it? You know, what do you want from me when you say things like this? And it's just it's it's horrible that we have to add on to the myriad of things that we deal with and then also have to navigate well-meaning comments like that and come out of it as having taken the high road because we're not allowed to take the low road ever. You know, even if even if we want to, society doesn't want us to take the low road. We always have to say, oh, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever you need. Uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Ha ha ha. Funny joke. Like, and, and it's just it hurts and it's it weighs on me constantly. And I think it weighs on a lot of us constantly in different ways. And, and I don't know. That's that's just kind of where that that is my uh, well-meaning story and kind of how that has shaped my life as an artist. But I'm not cutting my hair unless I want to. So, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, 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 my sister and I, we both straightened our hair for very long times. I was uh, a cheerleader in high school and I would every single day, a hot, a hot iron, a hot comb. And one day I just couldn't do it anymore. And I just started wearing my curly hair and my, my niece will have curly hair as long as I have to say about it, because this is a part of who we are. And if you don't want to believe that black people had hair like this back in the day, you shouldn't be running an opera company or an arts community or anything. If you can't realize that you don't need to change us to fit us into history, uh, there is something very, very wrong. Uh, going back a little bit to our prior question, but it ties into this a bit. I wanted to give Aaron and uh, Kenneth a chance to speak. Uh, they had raised their hands and I missed it. So uh, Aaron, how about you go ahead, hon? Hey, uh, everybody. Um, Y'all are out here speaking the truth. I got my little notebook here. I'm taking notes. We in church. I know what the Lord is saying from y'all on this morning. Thank you, God. Um, first, I just want to say uh, to like Josh, like, thank you so much for being yourself. Like, and just to anybody who could be young, who might be watching this, it's like, I'm not going to go really deep into the story, but the reason why I sing today is because my, fresh, my freshman year at Curtis, I saw two Black singers singing lead roles, just as good as the other white people on stage. And like, they were being authentically themselves. They were from the South. They were very Black, Blacker than Black. And they were just as good as their Caucasian colleagues. And I saw them and I was like, if I work hard, I can be just as good as them and I can do what they're doing and hopefully keep the cycle going of like, maybe somebody else will see me when they're 18 and be like, oh, I can do what he's doing. So just wanted to put that little tidbit in there. Um, when I, I remember I was uh, singing in Don Giovanni and after the show, this, um, this old man, this sweet little man, he could barely walk. Like he was, he was so little and he had his little cane and he was very nice and he came up to me and he was like, oh, I really enjoyed your performance. That was so great. I, I love this show and I've been coming to Curtis shows, you know, the people who come to give their two cents about how long they've been supporting the place that you're singing at or whatever. And um, he said to me, he was like, did it take you a long time to learn that Italian? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I worked on it for a while and, you know, I, I studied, you know, the translations and, you know, I had my coachings and I practiced and stuff like that. He was like, you know, that is so impressive. Like, I am so shocked. Like, you know, I've seen a white man sing in Italian, but a black man singing a whole opera in Italian. Wow. Good for you. And I was like, uh, thank you. And you know, actually, no, I didn't say thank you. I just smiled and walked away. But um, I remember in that moment when I walked away, I thought about it. It's so weird to me because us as black, as black artists in general, we're all held to a certain standard, like uh, something that um, Morris Robinson said on the LA Opera Live was that we have to be better than great just to be average. And it's like, I worked my behind off on that Italian. And so the fact that it stood out to him and was like all impressive and stuff like that, you know, it, it was kind of, I kind of was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm glad it was, it was nice. But it's, it's weird to me, like we, we have to work so hard, so much harder than everyone else just to be on the same level as them. And 
it's it's like what what do we have to do to receive that same respect like another like just to briefly go into like the first question that you asked i realized i was a black artist when i was the only person getting in trouble for missing rehearsals that i didn't know about you know it'd be me and a bunch of other white singers who weren't there and i'd be the only person getting in trouble and i'd be the only person being talked to i'd be the only person being talked about i remember hearing other singers being like that's so unprofessional like how can you miss a rehearsal or something like that you know I'm, I'm 17 years old my first year at school made a very honest mistake um but i tell you what i ain't never been late to another rehearsal since and i've never given anybody any opportunity to call me out on anything that is out of uh, that is outside of my control like if i if i'm going to be talked about it's going to be my fault you know what i'm saying so it's really interesting and just to quickly talk about something that julia bottom said um it is, it is actually really interesting that they want us, like they want us on their brochures, they want us on their billboards, but they don't want us in their meeting rooms. They don't want us in their offices and they don't want to actually hear what we have to say. And I really appreciate a lot of these opera companies giving um, African-Americans the platform to speak. Um, but also to be completely honest, all these conversations that we're having, all these stories that we are telling, these are the conversations we have in the green room. These are the conversations we have in our dressing rooms. These are the conversations that we have on the phone. I would love to see some of the some of these administrators who are allowing these platforms having this conversation with them. Because if you make that commitment in front of however many hundreds of thousands of people are gonna join you on that live to actually do something and make the change, those people can hold you accountable to actually do what it is that you say you're going to do. So it would actually be interesting to see what some of them have to say about certain things that we can do now, certain things that we can do right now to actually you know, spark up some change in the world just in general. So, yeah. Great, Kenneth. Hi, everybody. I um, I purposely sort of uh, sat back for a while just to listen to all of you because uh, I think I'm a little bit older than everybody here, just a little bit. He's still cute, don't get it twisted. Um, but um, I wanted to hear you um, and I wanted to see you um, while you were telling these stories because it's important. I'm sort of in that sort of awkward position of the generation before and your generation, like it's sort of this awkward atmosphere. Um, and so I, I feel like I have a leg and an arm on both sides of it. And so I've seen and experienced everything that you've said. And it sort of makes me angry and sad that we're still dealing with it. Like it's it's tiring that we're still dealing with it. Um, I grew up in Philly and uh, North Philly, and I would lived in a black neighborhood. I went to for the first four years of black elementary school and then bust to a school where I was the only black kid in my fourth grade class. And then went to a performing arts high school in South Philly uh, where there was every color of the rainbow. Then to college at North Carolina School of the Arts where the 20 black kids that were there, we all sat at the same table <laughs> and we all were a part of the black student union and we all supported each other regardless of the arts discipline that we were in and then to the heart school of music where i sort of experienced it kind of for the first time where there was a teacher on the faculty who in my juries said that it was unacceptable for me to use a spiritual as a selection on my jury and uh, my te my teacher who was white fought for me and went all the way to the dean and I was allowed to do what I had originally planned to do. Then I was a young artist at the Chautauqua Opera Studio. And of the 16 young artists, I was the only black one. And then into my professional career where I was told to stay away from Porgy at all costs by every advisor, <laughs> every coach, every teacher, every agent. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to still work. But every time I worked, I was the only one. 
I was the only one in the Bohem cast. I was the only one in the Traviata cast. I was the only one in the, you know, in the Butterfly cast. And there was no uh, Black stage management, no Black director, no Black makeup artist, no Black, no Black, no Black, no Black. And I started to hear the concerns of my other Black friends who were the same age as me going through the same stuff or not having the opportunities to go through the same stuff. And so I started my company for Black people, for Black singers, because it was out of frustration and necessity. Um, <clears throat> and so I hear you when you say this. And I, in recent years, have really embraced my artistry as it pertains to my Blackness. I, I do not sort of separate it anymore because I don't feel like I have to. Um, and those of you who know me personally know that I'm rarely one who minces words. <laughs> but in the beginning of the career, it's like, okay, don't be the loud one. Don't be the one that makes waves because then you're going to be labeled as a troublemaker. You're going to be labeled as difficult. You're going to be labeled as the one that the company doesn't want to deal with. I'm fine with that now because if for some reason you don't hire me because of the gorgeous color of my skin, then that's not where I'm supposed to be anyway. And so I go where I'm celebrated and not where I'm tolerated. And I learned that from my grandmother. Um, and so whenever I plan concerts and or recitals for myself, I plan music by people who look like me on purpose. And the moment that it hit me over the head was when I was planning a recital program. And as we're all taught to do in school, oh, when you're doing your, uh, your, your program notes, and you look up the composer and the dates from birth to death and you look up the poets and da, 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 da. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, whoa. So this composer wrote this cycle as a commission for this king or queen in Western Europe, at the same time, my ancestors were enslaved in America. And I've always known that sort of on the cerebral level, but when I was sitting at home at my table putting together this program, it was then that I decided never again will I sing a program that doesn't include composers of my people, never again. And I will sing spirituals and they will not be hidden in the encores because I am not Leontine Price and I will not sing nine encores. And so you may not get to the spirituals if the audience doesn't clap that long. They will be on the printed program right underneath Mahler and Schubert and Strauss and everybody else because they deserve to be. And so I, I, I embrace my blackness, I carry it with me even so far as to, I wear African print clothing when I sing, unless I'm contractually bound to a tuxedo. I wear, I bring my ancestors with me, just like I bring them with me in the rehearsal room. And it is, it is, a, it is a weight that is extremely heavy because I feel like I carry all of you, us with me to every job that I go to, because I know that administrators and conductors and directors are looking at me, judging me, waiting for me to make a mistake and saying, see, we gave one of them an opportunity, so now we don't have to hire the other ones. And so I hear you and I see you, and I want you all to carry the blood stained banner because that's what it is. I want you to be the Nat Turners of the industry. I want you to be the Harriet Tubmans of the industry and in saying enough is enough. You cannot, it is not acceptable for Porgy and Bess to be on your season. And that is the only box you check of color in your entire season. I removed my support as a subscriber from a well-known company because I went to see a Porgy and Best production. And then the very next year, they're calling to ask for my support and I see all the other operas and suddenly there are no black artists represented. 
The same phone numbers and agents that you use to contact them for Porgy and Best are the same numbers and agents you contact them for every other opera in the canon. And until they recognize that and until Black artists and Black moneymakers and Black patrons answer the call with their dollars and with their gifts, we're going to be in this continual cycle of trauma in this industry. So your generation and mine have to change the narrative on how Black artists are perceived, how they are casted. And it comes with changing the makeup of the staff, of the administration, of the board of directors, of the guild members, of the makeup of the orchestra, and every other part of the company. Do not just call on us to do outreach when we're in town doing a show that requires Black people to be a part of it. I cannot tell you how many times I have gone to do outreach for a company because I have been porgy and now it's time to go to the Baptist church in the city where I'm performing to hopefully bring new viewers into the audience. Why didn't you ask me to do it a couple seasons before when I was here for Bohem? Black people wanna see that too and they wanna see it even more if I'm in it. This doesn't seem like rocket science to me, but that's also one of the reasons why I speak out a lot, why I use my platform very loudly. And I call on my other artists of color, Black artists in particular, because there is a difference. I think the industry has gotten very comfortable with the term people of color, artists of color. No, 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 I am Black. And these are the issues that Black singers have to deal with, and you need to deal with those. These are the issues that Latin singers have to deal with, and you need to deal with those issues. These are the issues that Asian singers have to deal with, and you need to deal with those issues. We are not a one umbrella issue, and you cannot go and put a bow on it with Porgy and Bess. You can't just put a, a bow on it with Blue. You've got to put bows on it with Traviata and all of the other ones as well. So I say, speak up, speak out, speak loud and proud. Use your voice. The industry cannot survive without singers. It can't. So write your letters, write your emails, do your panels, do your lives, do all of it. Tell your representation. When you go back to the, if you're in a program, go back to your program saying, this makes me uncomfortable. And what are you gonna do to fix it? You cannot have me here to fulfill a grant application because you have to have a certain amount of people with melanin in their skin. That's not acceptable anymore. It's not. And though also another way to get through is these companies and these big gigantic competitions that are out there waving the carrots of tens of thousands of dollars and you see a black finalist, you see a black winner. One of the reasons is because <clears throat> all of that information and resources are going to the big gigantic conservatories where there are a smaller number of black students because it's either extremely expensive or it's so toxic that the few singers that are there are so traumatized by the time they get out, they're a mess. You've got to go to where the, a lot of the other voices are. Go to the HBCUs. There are incredible voices there phenomenal voices there in the same cities that these big opera companies are in. And so to say that there, there aren't enough resources and you don't know where to find them, that's bullshit. Excuse me for my French, but it's bull. You, ha you have to do the work and you can't wait for me to educate you on how to do the work. Otherwise, then I need to be in your office with your check doing your job. If you're in your office doing your job and collecting your check, then you need to do your work. You have to do your work. I can't do it for you. So that's all I had for this, this part of it. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Julia. I, Julia Bullock, I see that you have your mic off. Okay. I'm going to meet you. And Julia uh, Bottoms, um, somebody mentioned trauma. I, I think it was you, Kenneth. And Julia, I'm going to mute you for a moment. Um, and uh, my sister and I have had some lengthy conversations about how it seems like 
not just for the color of our skin, but we are in our industry oftentimes only wanted for our pain and our trauma. And black people are not being given the opportunity to tell happy stories. The narrative that is being put forth in schools, the only thing we learn about black people for the most part is that we were slaves in operas. It's that a son is being shot by a cop or they are in poverty and they live together in the community where nobody can seem to escape it. Um, and, and in art, uh, Julie, you can speak on that, but I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned trauma uh, and I, I, I want to give you the chance. Julia? Don't forget, we, we oh. invented peanut butter. We, we, got, we had that one. <laughs> Did a lot of stuff. And the air conditioner. You're welcome. Um, you know, on the note of trauma, I mean, Amanda, you summed it up really well just now. But real quick before I go into that, Kenneth, I had to get a pen. Um, I had to say what you said about I know where I'm celebrated. I'm going to carry that with us. That was pretty powerful to me. Um, but on the note of trauma, on the note of trauma, yeah, what you were saying, Amanda, it seems like everything that we're asked to perform and do, including in visual arts a lot of time, it seems like when you're a black artist, it's expected that, you know, you have to bring your trauma almost as this uh, commodity or something to share. And while I do think, you know, our history is full of a lot of trauma and that can be a powerful place to start. I mean, I know a series that I've worked on for a while started uh, with my outrage over the Trayvon Martin case, uh, but there's more to us as ours than that. And I think we should be allowed to progress beyond that trauma. Now, at this point, my work is more about celebrating Black lives that are still with us and celebrating people as individuals and, you know, not just as a, a reflecting on the past. So I want to be able to do that as an artist. And I feel like I'm, it's interesting to hear you guys as performers say that that's the same thing that you're dealing with is, you know, when you're cast, it's for this specific role or, uh, you know, you have to sing spirituals, which these things are all fine, but it should be on our terms. It should be up to us if we want to share those parts. It should not be a commodity um, or a form of entertainment that's just like rolled out as standard fare for black artists, you know? So that I, my thoughts on it are short. I think it should be on our terms. Uh, thank you for that. Now uh, we're going to go a little bit out of order for my notes. I, I um, but. I think this is a great way to segue into how the system is failing us from a very young age. Um, the, the industry is failing us as a whole. Uh, there's no denying that. But I think a lot of people are forgetting that it starts from a very young age where these ideas that administrators are carrying into their offices are reinforced and the ideas we have about ourselves are ingrained and then carried into our artistry. Um, and Julia Bullock, I wanna let you take the reins on this. But how, and, and Tyler, please, as, a, as an active teacher, give us your insight on what you think is being suppressed or what just isn't even being acknowledged, but the foundation needs to be redone. I think that's where it needs to start. Tyler, go ahead. Go ahead. Speaking as, as a teacher, I'd love to hear from you. Oh, sure. Um, I also have my notes. So I think that's the best way for me to like get all my points down. Um, so I, I first wrote, I was like, knowledge is power. So we all need to be learning. Um, and it's not only students that need to learn, but teachers as well. Um, there's, and we can even learn from students. I think that's very powerful. Um, so I wrote down things such as like, you know, I take all these foundations of education courses and, uh, elementary general music and secondary general music. And we learn things like, uh, you know, babies coo at a certain age and, uh, you know, the myth that if you teach Mozart to children, they might be smarter. But it's, I, why am I learning this week in a post that, and I'll read the quote, it says, um, by five years old, roughly kindergarten age, uh, children show many of the same racial attitudes held by adults in our culture. They have already learned to associate some groups with higher status than others. Like why, why am I learning that now at the age of 27 when I could have learned that back in my college days? And I think that's very important. So we need to shape students' lives even at a young age, even before five, um, things that are done in your households uh, that that your 
your kids and your students will bring to them to the outside world. So I think that's very important to, as, as an educator for me, to bring that to my school. And um, uh, I teach at a predominantly white school. And I think it's, you know, when they see me, they need to see, they see a black person and that's, that's great. And I need to show them that there are other things that they can learn as, as students, but I'm also a good educator as well. And I hope that's why um, I was hired. Um, and it's just important to expose them to different ideas and different different ways of teaching that might not necessarily be the Western way that was taught to me all the time. Um, and I, I just feel like it's important for me to use my voice and to, to just keep talking about things that are socially unacceptable uh, for students at a young age. And, and just to change how things are learned for college students as well. Um, I, you know, just remember going back on the classes that I took, I took two semesters of foundations of music education, which kind of outlines things like uh, uh, bullying and, and different colors of students in school. But why, why am I taking only two courses of that? I need to be taking at least a year's worth of things like that. And then I was talking with Amanda earlier, um, one of the required workshops and workshops as it's not even a course uh, is the DASA workshop. And that stands for dignity of all students. And, um, you know, I admit, admittedly, I, you know, rolled out of bed, went to that workshop and it teaches us very important things such as racism and uh, bullying in the schools like that those are courses that need to be for everyone it like it should be a social science requirement in schools and these conversations might be uncomfortable but they need to be had um and i i can talk some more after julia does her conversation just to kind of put some more points on that Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm, I'm feeling a little, a, a, a bit uh, like Kenneth here in, in terms of where I am and, and the my phase of my life and, and work because I have been thinking a lot about like what is the responsibility now for artists to begin these conversations. Um, because I know that many of us just want to be doing our jobs. We would like to be able to just study work and then offer something, but there is so much pressure um, amongst all of us to be leading conversation as performers when it comes to the change that needs to happen. And part of that, as many of us have already said, is because there is not, um, there are, there, there are, way more performers of color available. And so those in the industry are actually asking us to lead this. But one thing that I was so excited about, and I'm not doing this as a promotional thing for, for uh, Juilliard, but <clears throat> um, I was asked to speak, just have like a private session with, with two young women of color at Juilliard uh, earlier this fall. And in our conversation, it got, became very clear that ultimately they didn't just want to discuss um, their, the very troubling things that were happening to them as women of color and the, the messages that they were repeating to themselves and getting fixated on and obsessing over. Um, but they were worried about the implications that of things that were happening behind closed doors. I think this is another thing that happens in our industry. There's like certain things in, in our culture of the performing arts where you know things are said in a rehearsal room, but there's also a lot that happens behind closed doors in lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so intimate. <clears throat> and 
my gosh, I think everyone here has mentioned in one way or another, these private conversations that happen, but actually the little trauma that, that, that creates in us, the doubt or, and how we become fixated and obsessed over this thing. And it starts to determine how we interact with ourselves, how we see ourselves. Um, anyway, at the end of this conversation, I, well, I, the only way that I know how to make any kind of changes in, in, or if I'm given opportunity for a platform, I have to first research it and understand the culture of that place. So as we are doing here, I think a lot of us are telling personal stories. Um, and I feel that many people just simply do not know the amount of, the like, amount of stories and the patterns that arise from these stories. So if we were all given an opportunity to, to just lay it all out in some way openly, um, and then it could be organized, right? Um, and then relayed back to the industry that we are working within. And um, I, I feel that there might be a chance, a chance for healing to take place and for change to take place. But it's like, as I'm saying this though, I'm, I'm also thinking like why, there are people who deal with this outside of our industry and they handle it very, very well. They've been studying this and Juilliard hired an, out, an outside uh, group. It's called the, um, it's called the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. Okay, this is, and so they are training um, faculty, training staff, they ended up doing a lot of surveys and um, they were trying to understand again this pattern and then teach faculty to also in this, in this EDIB. Um, but I'm, I, I, one thing though I, I also just keep hearing from institutions is it just takes, it takes time for us to institute any kind of new changes or new programs or ideas. But I'm not sure, it's like there are also just, I know up times when it's very, very quick to create changes within, or, or if there's a cool project and there's immediately funding that gets supported that way, but why has this, it's always like, give us some more time, give us more space. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm receiving messages from, from uh, different education institutions saying like, let's begin this conversation again, because right as I was going to go in and have a conversation also about um, um, a, some, something within the vocal arts and addressing this within the vocal arts department at Juilliard, COVID-19 erupted in New York City. And so that in-person conversation couldn't, take, ha couldn't happen. And then all of this began again. So, or not began again, all of this came into the international consciousness again. Um, so there's, there's a pressure, there's a push for it. But my, my, my yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, it's very late at night here in Munich, so I'm getting, <laughs> losing a little bit of my train of thought. But the, the importance of, one, us understanding everyone, everyone being able to share. I think everyone actually needs to talk out and share their experiences. Um, and I think also the education, the question of education at any age, wherever, it's like that actually, we need to, it's not just about putting money where our words are, it's about putting our resources where our values are. And I don't know if our values as an industry, a music industry are actually well-defined anymore. I'm not, because I also looking at where funding is spent, it's on these major productions, but education actually, at least when it comes to the classical arts, needs to be a priority because we have failed. We have failed. It is not because people are not interested in music. It is not because people are not interested in art. It is because we have failed in being available and also really saying like as cultural, as, as cultural centers, our job is to be a place of service. 
right? And so when I'm looking at young people in the streets right now, protesting, there is, and demonstrating, and also, I, I mean, there's something really invigorating about it all, but also it's like, I see the anger, I see the frustration, I see the rage, and it, it will, without having an outlet, without having a channel through which, it's not just to connect your, to feelings, it's to organize feelings, um, it will turn into absolute fury. And understandably so. So I think just as all of this continues, as we are all uh, in this state of like shared consciousness around many, many issues, many pandemics happening at the same time in our world, we, we have to like focus on the, the healing aspect of art, the healing aspect. And um, that has to do with arts education. I think just at, like at the root of it, along with, it can, it can help to facilitate. It can be a part, it must be a part of facilitating the healing that is going to, needs to happen. So that, that's, yeah, that's all I wanted yeah. to say. About. Yeah, absolutely. Tyler, I'm gonna bounce back to you, but reflecting on that, I think I, I don't think I'm the only one here who has lost sight of the power of music and its initial draw for us. I've become so consumed with, I need to do my job really well so I don't get fired. I, I need to do my job really well so I get that review. And, and, you know, I've started to let go of that because I realized there are other income sources. How many people are out of a job and now having to get a new job and they're realizing they're far more happy doing something else and having music as the hobby, the thing that fuels their life rather than their income. Um, we need that reminder. However we can teach that, however, whatever it's through, we need to go back to the root of, of our source of joy um, and because for many of us, music is not an escape anymore. I got into music at least because I felt like I didn't belong in my community. And my music teacher was the only one who saw me. She truly saw me and Mosner, you're the best because she just knew that I needed to belong to something, even if it wasn't something that I could see, it was something I felt and I could contribute to, and it affected other people in a positive way. So we need to teach something like that in addition to inclusion and diversity and all these acronyms that are gonna come out in the next couple of months. Um, I want to give my sister and then uh, Aaron a chance to speak uh, before we go into a, a very uh, deep topic that I think we'll have something to say on. So Julia, I'll unmute you. Uh, yeah, on the note of education. So my background's in education and I still teach. Um, but I wanted to share a story about a, a moment that I thought was pretty significant in showing me that students, Black students specifically, are being failed. Um, I remember when I was in college, uh, I was taking a class on working with students that have disabilities. And Black students were categorized in this, which, you know, I think that's a whole other conversation. Um, but I remember the professor that I had at the time. Now, I've had some amazing professors and some amazing teachers like all throughout education. But this professor in particular, I remember she was teaching this class and it seemed like every time she brought up something about black students, her ultimate end message was that we're gonna lower the bar for those students. Um, I remember her talking about the way that students speak and like how, you know, black students specifically how they speak and how, oh, well, you know, but here's the expectation for them that it'll be down here for them. It's gonna be different for them. And I was enraged. I remember I got so upset with her and we went back and forth, you know, about this because I'm like, don't put the bar down here for black students when you wouldn't put it there for white students. You wouldn't say, oh, you know, this is the language of access and it's okay. What you're doing is you're setting up students for failure. And then, you know, they're gonna go on to college, a college that looks at them as a commodity and not as, you know, with their education in mind. And they're gonna be, underprepared and overpromised, and go through this system then where they come out on the other side having spent all this money um, and not actually being able to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I just remember with that professor, it just hit me so hard because I felt like she was constantly lowering the bar. 
And the, I couldn't figure out for a while why she would do that. I'm like, okay, well, where's this coming from? But after reflecting, I think she was doing it because it felt good to her. Um, it felt like she was doing, she was being politically correct and she was getting something out of it. So it wasn't for those students, it was for her. And to me, I think, you know, every teacher um, has to ask themselves if that's the case. And if it is the case, you have to recognize that your job as an educator is to prepare those students and to give them the tools they need. And if you can't do that, if you feel like you want to be too politically correct and you want to feel good, go into a different profession. Yeah. Oh. You, I think you can speak up my sister, Julia, or Julia, I know you're involved with a lot of boards as well. Um, but we've talked at length about even being a person of diversity and being on councils, you still face a lot of struggle to get change to happen. And it's like, if people aren't willing to accept your, your opinion and what you know for your community, at least for your small part of the community, because we don't re represent every black person ever, how, how do we get through to those people? I, I think we'll hit on that in allies, but I really would love to hear your opinion on that either now or later. Uh, yeah, I, I think that change is hard. And I think in a way it's almost uh, not up to, it's up to us to surround ourselves with people that really are, are going to listen. It's up to us to decide before we get into that meeting room, if it's a meeting where we're being asked because our opinions value, or if it's a meeting where we're being asked to add some color to the room. Um, and I've personally experienced that as you know, you and I have talked, I think that uh, change can't happen if people don't really want to hear when things are wrong or when things are off, you know, if, if there's no uh, commitment to self-reflection, then you're just there to add color. So I think if on our part, it has to be recognizing where we're a resource. So I think we have to recognize where are we gonna invest those resources. So if I'm gonna spend my time and walk into a room, I wanna know that that's a good, re a good place where my resource is valued and put to good use. I think you're still muted, Amanda. Uh, yes. Aaron, did you wanna say anything on this topic? Yes, I'm just writing down what Julia said really quick and we're just there to add color. Anyway, um, uh, just as like, you know, the, the baby in the group, I just graduated from my undergrad, you know, I feel like I'm an adult now. I'm just saying, you know, I can drink and I just, you know, I turn my tassel and whatnot. So I like, I'm a, I'm a big boy now. Um, and I'm joining the Juilliard family next year. So, you know, um, I just wanted to talk about like something, just like things in school uh, that have been happening for the past couple of days. Um, First of all, just like a tiny, short little bit of history. There was there was a there's a couple of things that have happened at my school. I went I went to Curtis, the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia for my undergrad, and there were a couple of things that happened there that you know weren't too you know black friendly. Like you know probably the biggest thing that happened and one of the first major things that happened was my second year. One of my really good friends was called the N word. Um, and actually she was called a really horrible phrase, but it involved the N word. Um, and uh, there was proof, it was through Facebook Messenger and there were screenshots and everything. And my school made it seem like this was something that, that could not hold any consequences for the people involved. Um, the person who was the main antagonist in this whole situation was not a current student at the school. So they uh, banned him from the campus or whatever, but the other people involved were still allowed to remain to continue to go to the school and they um graduated eventually and you know that that just was what it was and um i remember we were called into a meeting uh that lasted about like seven minutes where the president of the company said not the company the president of the school said that we weren't going to talk about it you know this is a this is a we have a zero tolerance policy for uh discrimination and you know we're a school all about diversity and whatnot but with uh, uh, respect for the holiday party, which is something that we have every year. He was like, with respect for the holiday party, we're gonna not have a conversation now. We're gonna talk about it next semester. And we eventually did. It was a horrible conversation where they brought in facilitators who talked about diversity and inclusion and about how we should respect one another from where we come, uh, from, where we come from and the different languages we speak, which wasn't the issue because the guy didn't say, because the girl, she's a Sudanese. 
Um, but the guy didn't say anything about her being Sudanese or different languages that she might speak. He called her the N word because she was black. And um, the issue was that it was a, an issue of racism. And we've had many conversations since then, uh, the entire school and you know, students weren't really on the black people side because they didn't know what was happening. But then again, they didn't care to find out what was happening because they never asked us. Um, but what I wanna say is this, this past week, there have been a lot of Zoom meetings and stuff like that with the school. And I was um, vice president of student council my senior year. And um, student, uh, when, when all of this stuff with George Floyd went down and all of the protests happened here in Philadelphia, Curtis sent out an email um, to us talking about the damage that the school had taken. And they said nothing about wondering if their students are okay, giving us any resources of how we can contact them or where we, you know, reach out to them for the kind of help that we needed as students. And um, this, the conversations that we had on Zoom were probably the best and most effective conversations that we've ever had. And I think it's because the students finally worked together and it wasn't just the nine, six or seven, eight, or whatever, black people fighting for ourselves. And the, the white students really, really showed up and showed out and, and, and had our backs and everything that we said. And one of the uh, administrators were saying, asking questions like, what are things that we can do right now? Like, what are things that we can get done? Like, you know, certain things take time. And one of the students actually raised their hand and like listed like six things that you could do. She was like, you could do an opera by a black person next year. You could have a concert that just has all African-American composers next year. You could have an African-American history class. You could involve African-American composers into the music history curriculum. And those are things that won't take time. And I also want to thank Kenneth for all that he's done. And I thank you for, for talking about how you've implemented African-American music into your concerts. And it's not a black history concert. It's not a concert that you're doing in February. It's not, oh, concert of all black songs, concert of all black orchestra pieces. It's just black composers who have good music that deserve to be on the same programs as Mahler, Strauss, Mozart, Verdi, Puccini, Rossini, Donizetti, like, and um, so I, I'm very proud to announce that because of all of the great work from the students at Curtis, they are going to have a Julius Eastman class um, because he is a he is a um, graduate of Curtis and they don't talk about him. I had no idea he went to Curtis because they don't say anything about him it's as if he doesn't exist. We had a whole year celebrating Bernstein and we celebrate Barber and we celebrate all the people, all the white people who went to Curtis and went on to do great things. but. We didn't say anything about Julius Eastman, and they are—they are—they have Google Docs where they're allowing students and teachers to, um, to post different pieces by African American composers that they can just do to do them, to like not for any special black occasion, just to do it because the music is good, and because we should learn because it's not black history, it's not black music, it's classical music, and it's American and it's history just in general, and so. Yeah, I'm just, I'm very happy about that. And a lot of students were saying, you know, it shouldn't be the student's job to get the work done. And while I agree with that, it should not be the student's job, but our faculty and our administration has um, proven time and time again that they're not gonna do it. So if we don't do it, nothing's gonna get done. And I think we all saw that over this past week because these students really, us, you know, we, we really came together and got something, something done. And so I, you know, I don't really know where I was going with all of that, but I'm I'm really proud to be a part of a group of people who are willing to fight for themselves and we can actually see uh, the benefits that come from when people work together and when the black people aren't doing it by ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. That was amazing. And it like very naturally goes into what we're gonna talk about next is being an ally and what they need to contribute and what we as black people need to contribute as well because the work does not end when they pull up their you know what they need to do we have to contribute too in a way and i'm curious what everyone's thoughts are what what do we need from our allies who are in the same position as us our allies who are in positions of power um the ones who we can have a whole talk about if we think it's blackface or not, but if the role is disproportionately being given to people who cannot, with full authenticity, portray it, when should they step down and give that opportunity to someone else? Because to me, that's a form of being an ally. Uh, so I'm I, sorry, I just wanted to say, 
everyone I'm, it, I, it is getting very late and I hate to leave it like this particular moment in the conversation about talking about being an ally that just feels uh really terrible no. um but I just wanted to I love you all very much I, I really enjoyed hearing from you and enjoyed that's an odd word but I'm just happy to see you and hear from you um okay keep Thank it on you. keep on going bye, bye. bye. Thank you. So in reflecting, you know, on what it, talking about this topic, I remember I saw something really beautiful from Jeffrey, sorry to call you out at this moment, but you talked about, we, we just can't close ourselves off. It feels right now like a little, too little, too late. And we just, we can't do that because we can't move forward on our own. That, that seems to be the narrative that's happening. That seems to be the history of it all is if we close ourselves off, and only only talk about what's not happening and condemning the people who haven't done anything up to this point, it, it's just not going to get better. So what do we need so they do better, so that we can do better, so that the whole system can get better? Kenneth, I will start with you, I, if that's okay. I think that, is that okay? I feel like you have things to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit. Um allies that come in the forms of people who are not black um i think is necessary and very important but what i would say is don't go rogue with your advocacy before checking in with us the best way to help somebody black is to ask the black person how can i help you so we have to open up the conversation so that it is a two-way street. The soon-to-be allies need to come to the Black people and ask, how can I help you? And then they need to have a conversation. And then that conversation needs to be taken to wherever it needs to be taken yeah. so that change can be made. Do not go into the room on our behalf without having a discussion with us. That is counterproductive because, you know, just like, you know, a, a, a director can't tell me how to be black if you're not black. You know, every time I go into a show, I need for the director and or the conductor to know the piece better than me. So when I sing Porgy, I need either the director or the conductor to know it better than me. I don't wanna have to teach you the piece. So I don't wanna have to, I, I need to teach you how to help me so that you can be effective in the room. And then you need to open the other side of the door to let us in the room so that we can tell our stories from our own mouths. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, uh, how, you, that's how you're gonna understand and feel the weight that we feel is hearing it directly from us so that there is no dissolution of, of, of power and of strength in what we need to get across. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, this is, everyone is there, like, I want to say something. Uh, let me check in. Jeffrey, do you, I, I really loved what you had to say the other day, because a lot of times amidst all of this, we're losing hope. We're losing mm. the unity that we're seeking. <laughs> it all of a sudden becomes an us against them battle, rather than a, we need every resource we can to contribute to that. If you want, would you like to elaborate more on your post? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, um, the biggest thing that I heard back was, you know, that, I mean, frankly, we're tired as Black people, and I, that's completely understandable. That's, I'm tired. Like, we're all, I understand that for sure. Like, we, we've been fighting for years just to be considered equal, but we can't, it's, it's, like Kim said, it's kind of it's counterproductive to to our to the movement as a whole to be closed off to people who are at least appearing like they want to help. You know what I mean? I in the post that I in the status that I posted, um, I said that yeah, we people that are speaking up, we 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 can't be so quick to accept the apology, but we have to hear the apology and challenge them and use that apology to hold them accountable to actually act upon that apology and show where their true allegiance lies in this fight. Um, because 
talk is cheap. That's just, you can say anything. You can say, um, you can say, you can say anything, but if you don't act on it, it literally doesn't mean anything. Um, so I think we can't, we can't just shut the door like, oh, you should have been, you should have been said that. You should have been standing up for us. It doesn't, you know, people are gonna, the whole point of this is for people to wake up at some point, eventually, as soon as possible. So we, as soon as they wake up, we can't just be like, oh, well, we can, but it just doesn't make sense to me to just be like, oh, you should have been speaking up. It's too late, because it's not too late. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, it is too late, but it's not in the sense that we're still fighting and we have we have things we have work to do together to really do this and to make this happen. So we just got to be, we have to be open to hearing them. Not necessarily, again, not necessarily accepting it right away because people have to prove, they have things to prove behind their words. Um, so that's, that's really all I was saying. I think we're just, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really it. I have a lot more to say, but it's not really on topic for this. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely, if, if everyone wants to stay or if just a few people want to stay, we can go into anything that anyone wants to bring up. Uh, Julia. Uh, yeah, I, I think something amazing about this particular moment is that we're seeing more support than we've ever seen. I mean, it's a shame that it's taken this long for us to get here, but we are seeing unprecedented support. So I, I feel like I don't want to go into my criticism of it without acknowledging that. But at the same time, uh, kind of like what I was saying in the very beginning, I think so some of that support, unfortunately, is becoming almost performative. Like I remember I heard a couple of days ago about a going bald for Black Lives Matter <laughs> trend which turned out to be a hoax anyway. Like somebody just posted all over Twitter and told women to shave their heads in support of Black Lives Matter. And instead of researching and saying, uh, why would I do that? What's the supporting? They just went and did it. So I think that really is a prime example of, you know, performative like support. So think, I, I want allies to actually, like you're saying, like ask what they can do before you go into the room. Um, but also I want like on our end, I want to see people really like, again, using their gifts and stepping out and doing what they can. Um, and most of all, like, this is one thing for sure. I just don't want to see people making this into a, a promotional moment, like a self-promotional moment, like something to, you know, turn into a, a, I don't know what the right word is for it. Just somehow making it into a thing that benefits them without actually giving support to the rest of us. So I'm hoping to see that change for sure. A spectacle. A spe that's a, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the word, a spectacle. Uh, Andrew. I, I, I really appreciate what everyone was saying, especially Jeffrey speaking about um, that we need to welcome people into this if they really want to explore what their allyship means and what, and what it's gonna mean for us moving forward out of you know the rage out of the 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 amazing thing that's happening with the protesting where do we go from that and i think though that's something we haven't really we don't really address is the difficulty with being an ally you know um i mean as a as a white ally not as a black ally when the message we don't even we need to address i think first the divisiveness in our own house and really like things like what we're doing right now understanding truly what our message is going to be to give to those allies. I'd like to take Tuesday as, as an example. Um, this Blackout Tuesday that took place, we see you know, the Black Square and whatnot as a, as a means of allyship. Some people had in our community had, a, had difficulty with that. They didn't see it as true allyship. They wanted to make sure also that it was not um, attached exclusively to the Black Lives Matter kind of mantra because we wanted to know that it, this was two separate things. But some people didn't, didn't see that as a true sense of allyship. Some people in our community did see that as a true sense of allyship. I think it's important that we need to acknowledge there are people out there that want to start showing that allyship. And I, and I think we've, we have heard that sentiment a few times that people are actually hungry for that now. They, they want to be a true ally to you. But when our message is, giving, is being given out in so many different ways, in so many different forms, how are you as a non-Black person supposed to internalize that message as the message to go forward with? 
I want to know, and this is kind of an open-ended question because I, I would like to know how, I mean, doing things like what we're doing right now is important. I think speaking and, and trying to unify, again, a word I've heard before, with our community as to what we really want to see as change, as a progress we want to give to those people, give the message that we want to give to those allies. And I think that, um, I think the first step for us really is to understand that that there are those people there for us and they're going to be there for us but but what are we doing as a community out of what is happening in this protest out of what is happening in in this amazing movement to ensure that the message that we want the people that we know this system is going to listen to to hold up because we know we, we're tired of speaking because nobody's listening to us we're speaking loud and clear ain't nobody not hearing us right now right but nobody listens to us they're not internalizing what we have to say we have to face it or not like it or not the system is tailored to a certain kind of person and that's the only person they're going to listen to in regards to changing it so we need to start looking at our own house i think and realizing that our message needs to be unified in a place that is prepared for it to be lifted up by the people that we know will be there for us through their allyship later on and that's fine that's my part yeah um well for me just a little bit of a backstory because i know we're running low on time but um i had a friend contact me because i'm sure all of us have been bombarded with text messages of like are you okay and sometimes sometimes that is 100 percent what's needed however that is not the case at least in this point because i i got a text from somebody who i consider a friend then i found out that this friend was basically texting all of their black friends the exact same message. And I understand the sentiment of checking in on your friends. And some people may get on my case for like, oh, but it was just a text message. You might be like overreacting. I'm not, I do not need manufactured concern in this time. I need to know you are 100% in to support me in the, the hatred that is right outside my door. Because unfortunately, racists are very honest. They'll tell you exactly how they feel to your face. I don't need to worry if, if you're 100% on my side because I know what they're capable of, but do I know what you are? That's all I need to say. Can I get an amen? Amen for that, okay? Amen. Amen. We have a church today. Right. So um, I just think just what, I mean, what everybody's saying with what Kenneth's saying that like, you know, what for our, particularly for our white allies, you know, if you want to be on our side and you, and you are an ally, you do have to arm yourself with the facts and you need to talk to somebody with experience. It is so, so important. And also uh, with, with uh, Rihanna saying about, you know, our friends messaging us, you know, it should be, um, how can I help as opposed to, you know, I hope that you are okay. And it's like, you know what, you know, I appreciate the sentiment, um, but like it's now it is time for you to put in work. And these are some things personally that I think that, uh, you know, our white, our white allies should do. And it's um, first, don't, don't make us your burden for your education. It is time for you to, to be responsible for your own education. It is. So once, once you say, I wanna be on your side, how can I help you? And you arm yourself with that information. Now, now it is time for you to go seek. And it's like, like these, the steps that, that people are taking, just like what, what Julia said about acknowledging that the, the support that we're getting. And it's beautiful and people are out there protesting and it's a wonderful thing to see. But now it is time, instead of all, all of you, you know, congregating in downtown, in downtown Boston, now, you know, white ally, go to your neighborhood and protest. Now it is time for white people to talk to other white people. Now it is time to educate your families, right? So it's like, you have to take these steps now to stop this cycle, right? We wanna stop, stop this cycle of trauma. And if you're really, uh, you know, an ally, a white ally, you have to start in your family, in your household. You have to start educating your neighbors. And like, and this won't end until we start getting to that core level, that base level of education at, you know, at the base of it. You can sit out there, you can, you can protest, you can read a book and it's beautiful. But if you're not doing it in your house, in your neighborhoods, then I, I don't think that, you're, that you're, you're just giving us lip service. And it's time for you to really, really get to the core of your family 
and really, really get to the core of your own community. That's what I have to say. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Tyler. Uh, yeah, so some of us are making a lot of great points. I appreciate all that. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that not only do our white allies have to step up and take action, but it's also people of color who are not black. Um, they need to do something as well. I know that on Twitter, I was seeing that uh, there was a huge separation between Dominicans and black people. And um, I, I know that a bunch of my friends who are not not white, but are Hispanic or Latin descent, uh, they need to be reaching out as well and seeing how they can help. Um, and it's it's very important as as an individual, maybe you cannot go out to a protest because you have health issues or something like that, but you could do something in your home as going online and seeing which which protest or which which organizations need funding and things like that, or simply going out and doing your part by voting. Um, it, it just there's so many little things that can create a larger uh, outcome that I feel that people need to remember. And it's also going back onto the, um, the, the black square. Um, I feel like you need to be able to check your friends. It's, it's very important because as Rihanna was saying, like people who are racist, they will flat out tell you, but, um, some of our friends might be saying things that we also need to check them on as well. Um, I, I remember earlier this week, I had a friend who was saying, you know, Black Lives Matter and he was down for the cause. And then I got into the conversation. I was like, oh yes, I, I believe that. Thank you for uh, saying that. And then he went on to say, um, well, it's, it's great because, you know, I don't see color and I see the person's soul. And I was like, well, hey, now, um, that's wrong because you should be able to see, right, right, Kenneth, you should be able to see this and appreciate this and understand that this, that there was struggle and we, there's history of people struggle, are people struggling? And once you acknowledge that, and you take action and educate yourself, then you can help us. And it's Black lives do matter. Um, and then uh, another thing, it just uh, based off of that, the Black Square, it's I went to a protest earlier this week and one of the speakers was saying that this is not a moment, it's a movement. And that it's going to take a long time for uh, things to get better. But if we continuously do our part as, as allies, um, then we will see the change that we are asking for right now. So that's, that's my part. Yeah, absolutely. Josh Blue? Yeah, I, I can't help but reiterate the, the, the notion that, you know, allyship and activism is not one size fits all. Um, and it is important to constantly remind yourself that just because you can't get out and be on the front lines of a protest and, you know, be out there protecting and rallying, that doesn't mean you can't help. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do that, you know, and from, from your home, you know, donating to bail funds and donating to different projects and different things that support and uplift these communities is important you know, being a rallying point for helping to uh, disseminate information from your home, like, you know, making sure people know where the safe places are and what's happening in their communities and getting information out is just important as being out there yourself. You know, we need that from all different levels. And I think a lot of people forget that there's a lot of ways to help. Um, and, it, you know, keep, keep looking out for those. But on that subject, you know, I want to help to kind of redirect allyship when it comes to asking of your black friends and colleagues and things you know kenneth said re it really well is come to us and ask us how can i help you uh because we're tired you know we we can't turn off 
being black and the news that comes about being black and our communities and what's happening in our world and we're bombarded with it constantly and there is a sense of i know this it's another kind of well-meaning thing where people will just immediately chime in and you know send you a message in your inbox and say like you know well how can you know what what do i need what should i know you know educate me um and it's not my job to educate you or anyone you know because we're dealing with so much and i want to educate and i want to help but i might not always have you know the mental capacity to give you my time and my knowledge anytime you ask for it which is why google can be your best friend you know, if you have questions and you don't have the opportunity or you or you know that your black friends are tired, Google something and not just one thing, multiple things, get lots of different bits of information. You don't want to just go to one site, read one thing and say, great, now I know, because that site might be completely different to what someone else is saying or what someone else is experiencing. You know, and if if we are in the if we have the mental capacity to talk about our experiences and offer you some tools for education, use them. You know, we have so much to give. And this I mean, this is true for any minority, anything. You know, I want to be able to speak on more than just the black experience, because there's lots of people, lots of minority oppressed groups that have a lot of information out there for you to understand what they're going through, what their struggle is and what they need from their allies. Uh, and it can't be on us to give you all the education because we're tired. You know, I don't I don't want to have to say to 12 different people, 12 different things when I could just say, here's a list of books by black authors that you need to read. And I've got the list and I'll send it to you, but then it's on you to do the reading, you know? And I wanna see that from my allies. I wanna see them taking ownership of their own allyship and not saying, well, I talked to, I talked to a black person. So like, I'm, I'm good now, you know, it's, it's gotta be more than that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm about to hand this off to Aaron uh, cause we've got a couple of, we're, we'll go a little bit over if that's okay with everyone, anyone who needs to go, we love you and we respect your time. Um, Somebody mentioned ordering food from black owned businesses. What a way to support them and also be exposed to their culture in one yes. bite. Yes. Right Say that again, Jeffrey. I just ordered some food right now. Yes. So, mm -hmm. especially in the DC area. Yes. Or wherever. DC, Get yourself some anywhere. Ethiopian food. Experience yeah. the culture. It doesn't it's stop you. with just like our taste in music and shit. Yes. I and curse. don't, don't, yeah, don't just move somewhere because it's cheap get to know the culture get to become an ingrained part of the society and learn about us we are interesting people we are an interesting culture every facet of it is fascinating and we exist see us and and admire us the same way that we are taught to admire against our will other cultures um Aaron, i want you to speak freely on on what we just touched on and to kind of close this out um tell me what black means to you if you had one word for it if you have one word if it's a couple um and and what hope you have but please speak about allyship as well it's funny because my my word that i came up with kind of has to do with what i was going to say but um number one yes go get you some black food just because it's good like it's good like who don't want a piece of fried chicken and some cornbread but anyway um uh i my 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 thing about allyship is i would just in, encourage um everyone not even not not just the white people like tyler said um i would just encourage everyone to think about what are the things that the black people can't do for themselves like for me and my my specific situation is i'm currently in philadelphia and when all the protests were happening and stuff like that they were very violent it, it, they eventually turned into that and i was hearing a lot of noises outside, gunshots, helicopters, police officers, and a lot of people screaming and yelling. And I knew that as a black person, that if I were to make the decision to go out and join, I would be risking my life. And in a, in a way, because there have, been, uh, there have been white people who have been hurt and they have been you know, uh, beaten and all those things. And so that there are definitely risks for anyone going to some of these protests, but it's like, I've seen videos of white people forming chains, forming chains to protect the black people because they knew that once they did that, the police officers wouldn't attack and they didn't. 
And so I'm just encouraging you to have a little bit of courage to, um, to be able to step out and do those things that, and even though there may be some consequences, you know, it won't be as bad, maybe. And, uh, and also like, like um, Kenneth said about going in and just yelling in the room. And for us, when we fight for ourselves, we are seen as the mad black woman or the mad black man. And that's just point blank period. It doesn't matter whether what we're fighting for is right or not. If we speak up and with, a, with just a little bit of passion, we're aggressive. And so it's very hard for us to effectively fight for ourselves because we have to come with a sense of composure that could convey like, oh, a sign of like, oh, they're just laid back. They don't really care that much. And so if you can go in with the right kind of information that you receive from us yelling, kicking and screaming, I really think it's possible to get things done, which is, you know, kind of what happened with the students at my school. And um, uh, Amanda asked us to think of like one word that we think, you know, just what Black is. And the word that came to my mind was brave. And I mean, as I'm encouraging, you know, the non-Black people to be brave, I think about how brave the people of color are who who are literally because what they are doing by protesting is risking their lives. Whether you see it as that or not, that is what they are doing. Um, because we've seen time and time again that we get killed by the police. So black black is just brave. Like the fact that our people could be oppressed for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. And all of our cultures and stuff like that have just been able to bleed through to the generations. And they may have been able to keep us in chains and keep us in service, but they never could break our spirits. And they couldn't break our hearts and they couldn't break our minds. And we're gonna to continue to sing. We're gonna to continue to dance. And we're gonna to continue to lift our voices and speak our truth because we're brave and we are us. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and you know what? The face of this revolution it is a revolution it's young kids like you you're you're literally just leaving the formative years and you have such bravery and fearlessness and and you it's not that you don't care it's you don't care anymore about what people who don't care about you think and you are ready to make the world a better place for the people that are doing good things and i I think everyone, because this was brave speaking out, because we don't know what's going to happen after this. You know, we don't know who's tuned in. And I mean, I can check the viewer list, but for the most part, they are going to take it how they take it. And I think that we've preached nothing but love and acceptance on our part, accepting help and accepting, you know, as an ally, accepting that you need to give help and you need to do your part. And does anyone else have anything to add? I do think that we each have some kind of project going on and we should give it the support it needs and deserves. So uh, Josh Blue, I will, I will advocate on your part. Uh, is that all right? <laughs> Go ahead and unmute yourself. I didn't hear you, oh, honey. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, Sanctuary Road. Everyone has to get it. It's a live recording of um, Paul Moravec, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. And and Mark Campbell, he is an idol in our industry, um, an oratorio <laughs> about the writings of abolitionist and Underground Railroad conductor William Still. And you can get it on Spotify and it's on sale uh, across music platforms. So please support our talented, talented storyteller brother. Oh, thanks. Yeah, of course. I want, I want to give a shout out and uh, plug uh, Jeffrey Miller's album that came out. We mentioned it a little earlier. Uh, it's on Spotify. It's called Songs About Women. Uh, I have been listening to it quietly in the background, pretty much on repeat this entire conversation. And it is it is food for the soul. Uh, it is so good. Jeff, I mean, man, like, you're incredible. I love listening to you. I love seeing what you do. Uh, it, it, check it out on Spotify. I'm sure there's other ways to find it, but, like, go listen to it, truly. Uh, thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was, uh, if I can speak on it a little bit, I'm not, I'm not going to take this on the promo it at all, but it was written about each of the songs was composed for, for the women in my life. Um, and they're all black women. So, you know, I just felt like it needed to be out there and it, I've been sitting on the project for a year. So I'm glad it finally came out the right way and, uh, feel free. Um, I guess I can, since I'm talking now, I'll just use the, 
I was talking about somebody else. Um, Kenneth has a recording of The Passion of Yeshua, and uh, I think we should uh, definitely check that out. Because he said nothing but amazing, amazing things um, these past couple hours, and I think it's, if it's anything, if it's anything as great as what he said, then we should definitely consume that and, and use that. And on top of that, uh, the film Black Opera, there is a Facebook page for it, and they are constantly trying to find and unearth stories about Black opera singers and their history and how it has led each of us to this moment. Um, and please contribute as you can and check it out. I The other day, it led me down a rabbit hole of research about, was it Grace Bumbry? Um, and her premiere on the talent search on CBS back in, oh, 1954, 56, something like that, when she was 17 years old. So it, it leads us down avenues maybe we would never research. Uh, does anyone else have anything to plug? Otherwise, oh, well, I always want to plug. I'm sorry, you guys don't know her, uh, but you should know her name. Um, my sister, Drury Bottoms, is always doing art and, oh, stop. Um, it, she has many projects in development. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I honestly, like, I just want to take the time as much as I appreciate it. If you're watching, go support the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And in the post, uh, in the event page, and I'm sure a lot of us will share it on our personal pages, uh, is an information sheet that we have typed out for you with websites and organizations that you should support. And if you give a dollar, it's a dollar more than they had before. So like that money talks, we know that. That's how we got to this place. So let your money speak in a meaningful way, but also let your voice be heard. There's also Black Women in Opera, they have a great, a great social media network that is always uplifting, not just women of color, but men of color too, and anyone who is deserving of recognition. Um, Joshua, Josh Conyers, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just wanted to give a little plug. Uh, I'm on the advisory board of the Newark Boys School, and it's for um, young men, black men, young men of color, who, who uh, you know, out of their struggles, they go to school for free. Um, who just, and they do, and they travel all over the world. They travel to Africa, they travel everywhere, just uh, sharing their gifts and, do, and doing it through music. And it's giving these kids off. So anybody who's watching, look at this. I know it's on um, our little um, inf info sheet. So anybody who's watching, support these children, especially during these times, they need it. And we, you know, it's a place for them to really, really, really uh, show their gifts and also get off the streets and do something productive. Tyler, go ahead, honey. Oh, okay, uh, so for several years, uh, myself and a uh, very good friend of mine, Nicholas Ash, who uh, stars on Queen Sugar, uh, we went to free the high school, Freeport High School, Long Island, shout out to Freeport. Um, and uh, a scholarship was established, it's called a steam train scholarship. And that is where we give a scholarship to a black or brown high school student who wishes to pursue a career in the arts. And that is happening again this summer. Uh, things are still being planned out, but um, I can post a link to my Instagram page where I will be heavily advertising it when it comes into fruition uh, later this summer. But yes, uh, advocacy for black and brown high school students and making sure that they they have a place in this world and are able to use their voice and give back to their community as well. Julia? Oh, everyone's muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there's a local organization that I would like to promote, Open Buffalo. If you can, go check out uh, their website. They have an amazing emerging leaders program. So they're preparing the next generation. So if you can support, definitely support them. And, uh, and I want to stress, all of these are amazing, amazing organizations. Does anyone else, uh, Eric, I have to support the cause uh, for creativity. Josh is doing his shanty songs and Aaron Crouch <laughs> is doing something actually that I think is 
part of the future of opera in a way, uh, challenging gender roles and challenging who can sing what in opera, regardless of who it's written for. So his program is called What the Fuck? And uh, it, he sings whatever he wants to sing. And that's how art should be. You should be able to do whatever you want to do as long as it is fueling love and creativity and it is in generous spirit. So you're on that side of me on this screen. So Erin, that one's for you. And please do what you can locally. Don't forget food pantries are in need. Um, women are in need of feminine care items. Families need formula. Go, and if you can't protest, if you can't find yourself to, if you are not in position to march, donate water to marches. They can use it to hydrate themselves and to help if they are sprayed. Um, and, and just get the word out that change is happening and greater change is coming. I think. Kenneth, do you have something to say? Go ahead, hon. The biggest, least expensive way to protest is to take your butt out there and vote. Please, please vote. And not just for the office of the presidency, all the way down the list, local leaders, police commissioners, judges, senators, governors, all of those things matter. It's free. <laughs> Register yourself, get yourself counted in the census and vote and vote for the people who want to make changes for the things that you believe in. Vote for those local leaders who are gonna see to it that our kids have arts and music in the, back in their schools. Vote, vote, vote. Yes. He said it's free. It's free. free. You can do it. Anyone can do it. <laughs> and it's your right. That exactly. Is a, it is a like universal right. If there's anything that's going to unite us, it is this right to, to say what we believe in and let it be known and written down for the rest of history. So please vote. I don't know if there's a better way to end this. Um, exercise your rights. And you have a right to be heard in all realms of your life. And you have a right to be valued for the t many different shades of black. I am just taking it all in. There is such a beautiful spectrum on this screen. And uh, so, yes, thank you all for giving me personally your time, for giving the world your voices. And uh, if there's any questions in the comments, if you want to answer them, I, I'll be ciphering or um, filtering through and trying to further educate people within the capacity that I have, <laughs> the energy I have. <laughs> I'd love to plug one last thing. Um, if you have the chance to, right now, A-Frame, which uh, pretty, hosts a lot of the uh, Oscar-nominated videos and movies, is offering uh, for free this week the chance to watch My Nephew Emmett, which is uh, a short story uh, about the moments leading up to the death of Emmett Till. Uh, that uh, was written by a black director named Kevin Wilson Jr. out of NYU, who's incredible. The film was nominated for an Oscar uh, last season, I believe. Um, it's an incredible piece. It's only about 20 minutes long, um, and it is on A-Frame's website, aframe.oscars.org. Uh, I highly recommend you go check it out. It's free for now. After it goes off, it's still available on like Amazon and all sorts of different places to purchase. Um, but definitely take a look, see. It's, it's worth your time. Awesome. I, I, I had something else to plug, but it's, it's already gone pretty long, so I'm not going to say it. But, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I was just going to say bye-bye, but go ahead, do it. Okay, yeah, okay, I promise. This is going to be quick. Uh, there's this thing called the um, Creative Collective, NYC. Um, it's it's just a great space for Black excellence. I met I met one of the founders uh, when I recently joined the, uh, the Soho House Membership Committee or whatever. So we're both on the committee uh, helping, you know, and I met them through that and I went to the, the culture con that they put on last year and it was just incredible. Um, I think Tracy Ellis Ross was a speaker, Kiki Palmer, um, Regina King uh, have been speakers in the past and it's just been incredible. So the, and on their Instagram, they just post a lot of resources uh, for black creatives, uh, including like job openings for companies that, you know, are looking for, you know, to fill some spots and they, they're just a great resource. So I think we should definitely tap into that. 
I'll put the info in the chat. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I can't say it enough. And I love all of you. And please stay strong, stay safe. And let's all do our part. Okay. Love you, Amanda. Thank love you, you all. Thank, thank you, Amanda. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi, friends.